let me know uh, what the volume is like and if anything needs to be lowered or anything. New York taught me to believe in fate. Had you asked me about fate back when I was a human, I would have told you it's just superstitious bullshit that we are all designers of our own destinies. That belief shattered when the richest woman in the United States, the actual richest one, not a face you could have seen in the papers, of course, sank her teeth deep into my neck. It happened in the very same place you're standing in right now, by the way. Fate? You decide. Please, there is absolutely no need to be hostile. Just listen a little longer. See, my mistake was that I flew too close to the sun. It makes sense that my punishment was to never see its glow again. I was incandescent myself. I was hot shit. I had it all. Money, looks, confidence, connections, men, women. A career and a spark in my eye. The one you need to be born with. And that's when someone far more powerful than me saw my radiance and thought. That won't do. Uh, real quick, just for the sake of testing the menu, I'm gonna click into this thing. The beginning, your introduction to the world is up. Alright, so the, the book is the log. Do, 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 do. This is the dictionary, so I guess it's almost like a little glossary of, uh, you know, kind of kindred terms that we'll get. Okay, cool. Solid. She robbed me of the light erupting from within and gave me a subtle, enduring gleam in its place. She decided that would fit me much better. She was a ninth generation kindred just like you, an apex predator. She probably enjoyed teaching me, the peak of human excellence, my real place in the food chain. It's such an eyesore when you look at some... Ooh. It's such an eyesore when you look at some loudmouth braggart and see them for all they really are. The temptation, to, the temptation to teach them a lesson can be unbearable, right? Well, my... I gotta let this thing scroll before I start reading. Sorry, folks. Well, my sire's lesson was a lesson about fate. A message saying, You're eternally doomed to be at the mercy of your sovereigns. It almost drove me to destroy myself. What saved me was the ability to reinterpret her teachings. Hers wasn't the message of doom, it was a message of hope. Fate exists, and one can shape it if given the right tools. My sire didn't believe my tools were fitting for the job. She considered them toys and me just her amusing subject. 
Well, she's deader than dead now, and I'm still here, standing right where she stood when we first met. Oh. Ellipses. You might have wondered how I've learned about your arrival to JFK Airport. My answer is, of course, destiny. As luck would have it, today happened to be the to be a day some of my associates were inspecting the coffins. Driving you here straight from the plane and having you wake up in such an unfamiliar place was a little desperate, and I do apologize for it. But it is so rare for you to visit New York. Three times in the last 15 years, was it? And you're never eager to inform me you're here. I understand you still have that meeting on 53rd Street later tonight, so I'll provide a comfortable transport. I value our relationship very much, don't get me wrong. But it is precisely because I value it that I'm going to ask you to repay the favor you owe me. You're the only one I trust to do the job well, and without attracting attention. You might think I'm crazy asking you to breach the rules of our society like this. You might think it's impossible to get away with it unpunished. But this is New York, and I don't know about other cities, but in this one, fate really exists. And right now, it's smiling in your favor. This is how it begins. Your phone rings. It's your boss. Again. The setting sun that filled your high-rise office an hour ago is gone. The city looks like an ocean of light from up here, spreading for miles to the north. You pick up. You are about to call it a day. Forget about, forget about the world of fintech and decompress at home. No dice. Ooh, what kind of voice? A Saurian sleeve, alright. One of the investors wants to meet you. His voice is always the perfect mix of authority and sleeves. He'll come by your office in an hour. You look at the clock. An hour? He's gotta be kidding. Yeah, I know, but stick around. He's a heavyweight. You'll want to make a good impression. Fine. You grit your teeth a little. The boss hangs up. Two hours. Might as well pour another coffee into yourself and figure out how to best use this to your advantage. You suspect everyone knows that no, you're actually not happy with your current position. That in fact, you feel squished against the glass ceiling that comes with the territory. Sure, your idiot superior might have gotten the job only because he's the CEO's golfing buddy, but you... You're going to put an unholy amount of work into your advancement. Times were you'd laugh off the idea of staying at the office until 9pm. You had a partner to go home to, the nightly Netflix and chill ritual to perform, complete with pizza or Chinese takeout. Ever since you moved up the ladder, though, your hours have only gotten longer. Food? Mostly at the company cafeteria. Sometimes takeout, always in a rush. You praise the heavens for your crazy metabolism and dread the day it finally decides to give up. Uh, real quick, uh, I'm just gonna up the typing speed a little more. That way there's not such a delay between, like, me reading out that stuff. Uh, full screen. Just want to check the stuff. Alright, I think we're good. God damn it. Load. Ah, here we go. Oh, this game is dope. Saves right on my spot. Okay. 
It's a little faster, not terribly so, but let's go. Food? Mostly at the company cafeteria. Sometimes takeout. Always in a rush. You praise the heavens for your crazy metabolism and dread the day it finally decides to give up. Rest. At this point, the cleaning lady who takes care of your apartment probably spends more time in your bedroom than you do. You flash back to your boss quoting Shakespeare to impress his new, extremely attractive, and uncomfortably young secretary. For some must watch while some must sleep, so runs the world away drinks, mostly with colleagues, and they all pretty much hate you at this point. Another flashback, this time to the most profitable quarter in the company's history. Still, the board decided that layoffs were in order. Your boss didn't feel like letting people know in that person, so he passed that privilege on to you. Gotta hand it to him, he always knew how to pick his battles. But maybe, just maybe, tonight is the night it's all going to change. You decide to play the good looks angle. Nothing too slutty. You leave your blouse slightly unbuttoned. Check if your ass looks as good as you remembered in your pencil skirt. Mirror says yes. Attention, we are being followed. Shall I dispatch the welcoming drones? Ooh, thank you for the follow. I can't see who it is from here. The chat is too small. Uh, let me leave studio mode for a sec. Ah, Alicia. Dope. Thank you so much. It's not something you're proud of, but you've become too jaded to care. Knowing your luck, the investor is going to be one of two types. A self-obsessed Musk wannabe in his 20s, or a fat old pervert drenched in cologne. You hear the elevator ding. Time to get this show on the road. You take one final look in the mirror and fix your hair as the footsteps echo across the empty hallway. The man who approaches your office is not what you expected. He's slick, to be sure, but he seems a bit more refined than your usual company man. Expensive suit, matching tie and shirt, confident in his stride. Surprisingly good looking. Good evening. I hope this unforeseen visit isn't too much of an inconvenience. God, that voice. You're taken aback by how smooth and strong it is. And his eyes, steel blue, cold, intense. All right, blue steel. Looks like our boss is Derek Zoolander. He's all business, professional, treats you in a manner that's appropriate to your stature. When he speaks, he actually looks you in the eye and not at your cleavage. He asks some questions about your work tells you how he noticed your input after talking to the CEO, another golfing buddy, and it comes charmingly close to calling your boss an incompetent doofus. All the while, you try to guess his accent, but can't quite place it. European? Sure. But where from? Oh, I've got to give him a new voice. Uh, I guess we'll go with RP. I just assume all Ventru are posh. I know I've kept you long enough, but would you indulge me and join me for a drink? Of course. For a minute there, it seemed like he wasn't that kind of guy. But what the hell. You go with it. He seems nice enough. Besides, it's not like you have other plans. Oh, these are some nice tunes. And wow, these are actually like very dynamic. You can see like the little particles. 
I hope my cursor isn't too distracting, but you can see like the little particles here and the steam coming from the coffee, tea, whatever that is. Very cool. The investor has a limo waiting downstairs, and the driver takes you to a high-end restaurant in Williamsburg. Oh, I love Williamsburg. Oh, I miss it. A seat is waiting for you in the deluxe lounge. It's just the two of you. You talk about this and that. Your companion seems to have a knack for history. So tell me, what would you do if you had full control of the company? You almost choke on your wine. This is your chance. You say what's been on your mind for months, but hide it behind the veneer of professional corpo babble. Refocusing. Listening to your instincts for once. Restructuring. Kicking out your boss. Aggressively pursuing new markets. Getting the hell away from all these horrible people. He likes the sound of that. He leans forward, his eyes flash with intensity, and something else. A strange emotion that wasn't there before. But you'll do just fine. Uh-oh, we are in the spoop zone, my friends. His words echo inside your head as you black out. You wake up. God only knows how much later. As you try to piece together what happened, you hear a familiar voice. The investor, or whoever the hell he is, talking to someone. You suddenly recall snippets, fragmented memories, his sapphire eyes intently locked with yours, his teeth suddenly longer and sharper. And something else. A, a feeling on your neck that takes you back to your last orgasm. A company trip to Florida, a sweaty room, the cutie from HR who doesn't work there anymore. And then darkness. Yes, I'm done here. Consider my debt paid. What debt might that be, Mr. Zoolander? The investor pushes the other figure aside and walks away from the lounge. Barely bothering to look at you, the door's locked. The, doors, the door locks behind him. Some time passes before you find the strength to get up from the couch. You touch your lips. Blood. Did that asshole hit you? You try to stand up, but your head is pounding, and your stomach is like a heavy knot pulling you down. You didn't have that much to drink. You must have spiked your wine. This is bad. You frantically check your clothes. Pristine. Doesn't make any sense. All of a sudden, the feeling hits you unlike anything else you've ever felt before. You fall to the floor, writhing in all-encompassing pain and... Hunger. The kind that makes your insides burn. That cannot be denied. You try to calm yourself down with a breathing exercise they taught you at some bullshit mindfulness course. That's when it hits you. You're not breathing. And holy shit. Should your heart be jumping out of your chest with that realization? But it's not moving. Not even a beat the door unlocks. You hear a startled voice. A young man in a waiter's outfit, his accent thick with an Eastern European harshness, leans over and asks if you're alright. For a brief moment, you wonder what the hell he's doing here. Everything is wrong. Then his smell reaches your nostrils. It's intoxicating. Everything feels right again. He holds out his arm to help you stand up. You grab it firmly with both hands 
and then you bite down. You sink your teeth right next to the old school pinup tattoo of Rita Hayworth on his forearm. It takes you a moment to process what you're doing. A part of you wants to break away, but a stronger voice implores you to keep drinking. One thing becomes clear. You are definitely enjoying this. He only struggles a little, and quickly falls to his knees. You can see his eyes now, pale, blue, and confused. You can only bring yourself to let him go once he collapses onto the floor. Your bite leaves a mess of his forearm. Poor Rita, all bloody, missing half her face. Did you? Did you just drink this guy's blood? Ellipses. You spit out a piece of torn flesh. That's, uh, why? Where? What was it, that fucking wine? Barely able to focus your heart and your lungs still motionless, you reach out for your phone and dial 911. Ah, oh, boo. Come on, girl, we can't talk to the feds. 911 operator, what's your emergency? <laughs> I'm not gonna auto narc. Um, we know they don't respond to this one. My heart stopped. My heart. It's not beating. Ma'am, where are you right now? The door to the lounge swings open. The man who enters is not the one that brought you here, though there are similarities. He's tall, for one. Broad-shouldered, handsome. Dressed in an immaculate suit, but his skin is darker. And the look on his face tells you he is not here to negotiate a deal. He notices the smartphone in your hand. The stranger. Pass me the phone if you want to live. The man's voice is persuasive, calm, but carrying clear threat. He's got the aura of a viciously efficient corporate shark. Shark. You find it hard to argue with him. Ma'am? Hello? I feel like I've already committed to the Arnold voice. I apologize for wasting your time. My new colleague got drunk and is now trying to impress everyone with her antics. Good night. I know that's a very terrible impression. Please bear with me. He disconnects the call and places your phone in his pocket. For whatever reason, you can barely take your eyes off the stranger. As hypnotizing as his presence is, though, it is also highly discomforting. Good evening, miss. I'm here to pick you up. Oh gosh, that's terrible. We'll give him a new voice. The Arnie reference is out of my system now. Um, I mean, we don't really care who he is. Ambulance is out of the question. Pick me up. Pick me up. Oh, what kind of voice? All right. Did I stutter? The stranger approaches the waiter and examines his body. Critical condition, but he might live. Anyway. He then sets his sights on you.
I know this is all new to you, but I've dealt with hundreds of strays like you, and going by experience, they tend to fall into two categories. First, there are the smart ones, who carefully obey my every word and don't try to pull off anything stupid. I always get them where they need to be safe and sound. And then there are the dumb ones. The punks who thought they could take me on. The wise guys who try to contact somebody secretly and without permission. The troublemakers who try to run off or make a scene. None of them got to their destination in one piece. In fact, most of them never reached their destination at all. His voice becomes slightly bored and monotone. You can tell he's given this speech before, likely dozens of times. So you see, while I generally consider myself pretty smart, I'm also a Mets fan. It's my one true weakness. Oh, that's a glaring weakness, my friend. One that inspired me to come up with a three-strike system when dealing with pups like you. A baseball references. If you get on my nerves once or twice, well, I understand. Not all of us perform well in stressful situations. Cross me three times and you're out. No excuses, no forgiveness, no mercy. As he's talking, he slowly approaches you, adding a bit of theatrical swagger to his walk. Eventually, he leans in, deliberately invading your personal space. You realize it's a test. He's daring you to do something about it. Three strikes and you're out. Say, I understand, sir. Now. Every atom of your being screams for you to obey his authority. Ooh, okay. What are you even talking about? Fuck you, sir. I understand, sir. Okay. I mean, you know what? We've lived a corporate life. We're supposed to play a Ventru. We'll be polite until we're in a better position. I understand, sir. Stick to that tone and you'll do just fine. Moving on, is there anyone you'd want to inform of your current situation? Tell them you're alright. He flashes his fangs briefly, and for some reason the sight sends a chill down your spine. There is something very wrong about him. I kind of wonder if he's a gangler. Someone closest to you? Oh shit. This is a test. Anyone we name is going to get whacked. Ah, yeah. Whoops, my boss, my supervisor, my boss, I suppose. The stranger squints at you. Forgive me, but am I to assume your relationship is more than professional? You immediately give him a piercing glare. Oh no, don't glare at him. We're playing the long con, come on. No, God no, me and that pig? Don't be ridiculous. Ugh. You said he was the closest person to you. You asked me if I have anyone I'd like to tell I'm alright. The answer is yes. People at my office. I don't want to lose my job, so I'd prefer to let them know I didn't just go off on a bender. No family. No lover, no friends. 
Mind your business, bro. Ah, oh, this dude, come on. Your blank stare tells him the whole story. He immediately stops prying and gives you something worse than a look of pity. A look of honest compassion. Don't patronize me. I'm gonna have to get some water soon. Well, that just makes things simpler, but let me be crystal clear just in case. Oh, you know what? I know I'm ghost. This voice reminds me of Alucard. From this point on, you are subject to different laws than the ones you grew up under, and you'll be watched by many eyes to ensure these laws are respected. You are forbidden from letting anyone know you're still alive. You are forbidden from showing your face anywhere they know you. If anyone comes looking for you, it's over for both you and them. That practice tone again. You put on your poker face and listen in silence. So unless you want your boss to end up at the bottom of the Hudson, I'd suggest you cooperate. Don't tempt me. He smiles, revealing his fangs again. There's something absolutely sickening about it. Suddenly, you feel overwhelmed by a sense of exhaustion. You pass out. When you regain your senses, you find yourself in the stranger's arms. The man is holding you as you would a spouse who's had a little too much to drink. You try to break free, but he holds you close and gives you a cautioning look. Only when you cease your struggling does he let you go. Only now do you notice the change in scenery. You find yourself in a fancy lobby, right next to the elevator. The place is virtually empty, save for a single concierge and some cleaning staff. Your companion gestures at the concierge as you pass and he picks up the phone. The elevator arrives, the door opens, and the man, motion towards, the man motions towards the cabin. After you. Where are we going? To a safe place. That's all you need to know. Trust me, you don't want to make this difficult. Just get in. Let's play it safe until we got a good angle. Going against your instincts, you enter the cabin. Smooth jazz is playing over the speakers as the elevator starts its descent. You are dazed, panicky, but somehow locked in place. On the one hand, you find the stranger's presence oddly soothing. On the other, you can feel your body tensing up with stress. You can't help but think back to the young waiter. The dull-eyed look on his face. The confused look he gave you just before... No, it's better not to think about it. Plus, you have other things to worry about. Like the fact that you're being kidnapped. The cabin door opens at the same garage you arrived at with the investor some hours ago. The man shows you a black Cadillac Escalade. Oh, not if you ever see this. It's another mom mobile. Why 
I know what you're thinking, getting into a car with some strange man. Boy, sure seems like a dumb idea. Maybe I can make a run for it. I might be able to lose him. So let me be perfectly clear. Your best bet is to get in, relax, and enjoy the ride. The waiter, what do you want? I have money. Fuck the waiter. This dude doesn't want money. What do you want? What do you want from me? To meet your new superiors. You'll see. Superiors? Is this what a hostile takeover looks like nowadays? No more questions. Get in the car, please. We'll get in the car. It seems like the worst idea ever, but the man's made it very clear that you have no choice in the matter. Yeah. Let's stop calling him Stranger in the Man. What's your name there, Frontorino? Can I at least know your name? You'll know it when the time is right. He takes a glance at expen he takes a glance at his expensive looking watch. Listen, you really need to quit stalling. We're on a bit of a schedule here. The sun comes up in about two hours, and I don't intend to be here when it does. The sun? Praise the sun. What does it matter when the sun comes up? Nah, you really don't know, do you? Good thing I got here when I did. He opens the car door and gestures towards it. You see no point in delaying the inevitable, so you get in. The door locks behind you. The Cadillac is almost entirely dark. The side windows seem light-proof. The man gets into the driver's seat, starts the engine, and drives away without another word. Did I die? Did I die? Depends on your definition of death. Listen, I realize you have many questions. Tomorrow you will get some answers, but tonight you need to do what I say. And right now I need some quiet. Please. You feel too confused to protest. You stay silent for the rest of the ride. Even as more questions bubble up to the surface. One of them being, did you actually kill someone tonight? Staring out the window, you find it hard to focus and quickly lose track of where you're headed. You can only tell that you haven't left Manhattan. Oh, Manhattan's the best. Another underground parking. Almost featureless, empty. The car stops, and then the man opens the door for you. We're here. The stranger walks you to a nearby door. He opens it and motions at you to get in. Go on in. Make yourself comfortable. If you get hungry, again, take a look in the fridge. I'll pick you up tomorrow, and you'll get your answers. Behind the door is a small room. No windows, just a simple bed, and a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. A small fridge is humming away in the corner, accompanied by a rattling AC fan in the wall. You're leaving me here. That's it? You're just gonna leave me here? That's it. For now, at least. Look, this room is your best chance of seeing another night. 
I realize you've been put in a problematic situation and it's not entirely your fault. Cooperate and you might still make it. You will learn more tomorrow, but for the time being, get in and get cozy. He gestures inside the room. Gonna keep playing it safe, at least for this venture. You step inside. The stranger nods. Good night. He locks the door behind you. It looks very sturdy. You open the fridge. There's a single plastic bag there, filled with red liquid. No label. Tomato soup? You feel sick to your stomach. Best to leave it for now. You lie down on the bed. It's a simple mattress on a metal frame. At least it's not too filthy. You think back to how this evening began. This investor, is he friends with the dark-skinned stranger who picked you up from the restaurant? What happens now? Unable to relax, you spend an hour or so playing out various scenarios in your head. Eventually, you decide to give in and let exhaustion take over. Whatever tomorrow brings, you'd rather face it while rested. Plus, there's no way in hell your boss isn't going to notice your absence tomorrow. That and maybe some of the restaurant staff will feel a pang of conscience. Someone will notify the police. Someone will find you. Right? You flash back the waiter's tattoo. The bloody Rita Hayworth winking at you over a pale mess of a wound. You did this. You bit him. Drink his blood. And it tasted good. What if you can never go home again? You are so tired. Your entire body tenses up one last time. And before you know it, you drift away into oblivion. You wake up. That in, it, that in itself is a surprise. You barely remember when you drifted off. It didn't feel quite like sleep, more like plummeting into an endless void. You imagine that's how death feels like. AC is still rattling. The refrigerator is still humming. You take a look at your watch. It's almost 9 p.m. You've slept for 17 hours straight. Maybe you died. Your breath is gone and you feel no thumping in your chest. Does that qualify as dead if you're still conscious? Conscious. You're not sure about that, but you are certain about one thing. You are hungry. It's not your stomach rumbling, though. It's a need that starts somewhere in your abdomen and spreads to your chest, throat, and back of the head. You open the fridge. The bag is still there. You take a closer look at it. If it is soup, then its color and texture are off. You pull the cork out, take a whiff. You recognize the smell immediately. Holy shit. There's no mistaking it. It's bagged blood. 
the smell is faint, and you remember some situations in the past where you found it nauseating. But now it's almost... No, not almost. It is enticing. Drink the blood. Blood for the blood god. It feels wrong, but right now there's barely anything in your life that doesn't. To hell with it. You pour a bit of the liquid into your mouth. It tastes like shit. It's coppery, thick, and clings to your tongue and the inside of your mouth like a film of dirt. You swallow hard regardless. The taste is foul, but somehow you kind of want more of it. As you take a second sip, sucking the blood out of the bag, you feel something pull on your insides. You double over, you're going to barf. You instinctively cover your mouth, looking for a place to vomit. Before you find it, a dark red wave washes over your hand and fingers. It hits the floor, splattering in huge, thick drops. You keep heaving for a moment longer. Nothing is coming out. Not blood, not bile, not even spit. But still something in your body wants to push it out. Push it all out, every last drop. As you recover, trying to wipe droplets of regurgitated blood from your dress, you hear the lock click and see the door open. Standing there is the well-dressed stranger you met yesterday. Immaculate suit again. That predatory look like a hawk on the hunt. But somehow more relaxed tonight. So, like a tamed hawk, maybe. Good evening. I was... He notices the spatter. Your red hand. The sick look on your face. He barely contains a smirk. Oh, was the catering unable to satisfy your exquisite taste? Apologies. Yeah, you know what? We'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep playing that polite angle. We'll offer him a drink. You can't tell me you can drink this. He takes the bag off your hands and pours all of its contents into his mouth. He closes his eyes, theatrically savoring the taste. When he opens them again a few seconds later, he looks sharper, energized. Not all of us are picky eaters. Come on, we've got places to be. I should have some water and a towel in the back of the car so you can clean yourself up. The car is humming in the empty parking lot just outside the door of the cramped room you've spent the day in. The man motions to it, politely but with a stern look on his face. Get inside the car. It sounds like I have a choice, right? Sorry for the pause, folks. That's just me making sure Streamlabs is, you know, on the up and up. Correct, but your cooperation is appreciated nevertheless. You take the back seat again. The door is locked. The stranger takes the wheel and starts the car.
You drive in silence for a while. From time to time, you keep trying to catch glimpses of familiar streets or landmarks through the blackened windows, but it's a little it's of little use. The car is also soundproofed, so all you can hear is a bit of traffic humming and the car's engine. The driver doesn't say anything and seems focused on the road. You check the door handle. Yeah, the door is locked, all right. The piece of dark glass separating you and the front of the car looks sturdy, too. There is nothing left to do but wait. You didn't have time to think about it before, but you realize now that you're hungry? No, not exactly. It, it's not a rumbling stomach that grabs your attention. These dynamic scenes are very nice. It's a need that starts somewhere in your abdomen and spreads to your chest, throat, and back of the head. You become restless. This is essentially a kidnapping. Whatever this guy says about its purpose, it doesn't change the fact that you're being held against your will, and you're not used to following orders when you can't delegate them to somebody else. You feel you need to get a semblance of control over the situation, so you decide to prove yourself useful. I have a worthwhile skill set. Yeah, let's make ourselves invaluable in some way or another. Listen, I'm an investment advisor, and I have a lot of experience in fintech. Whatever your organization is, it might find a use for me. I don't even have any idea what fintech is, and honestly, I don't care to find out. A short pause. I'll be frank. Currently, you're in no position to offer anybody anything. The sooner you accept that, the better. Ridicule his lack of ambition. Well, out of all these three, this is probably the closest. Big words from somebody's dedicated errand boy. I wonder if you've ever achieved anything. You push the right buttons. He gives you an absolutely furious stare through the rearview mirror. For a second, you spot a crack in his professional demeanor. You don't know anything about me. You have no idea where I'm coming from or where I'm headed. For a few seconds, he quietly fumes. Your attitude won't help you make any friends, and in your current position, you definitely need some. Consider that. Preferably in silence. That dull hunger strikes you again. The powerlessness hurts. You are used to people listening to you. Or pretending to care about your demands, at least. The driver doesn't play that game, and that annoys you to no end takes you another 20 or so minutes to get to your destination. As the door opens, you try to get your bearings. You're still in New York, as that much is certain. Queens, maybe. After me. No sudden movements, please. You approach a nice-looking building that houses a two-story gallery called the Art Hole. Ugh. Two large men in suits flank the door on both sides, and they give your companion a nod as you approach. Prompted by the stranger guiding you, you walk inside. 
the gallery is full, which is unusual at this hour, to say the least. About two dozen faces fill the showroom, and a number of waiters navigate the gathering, serving drinks. All of them are beneath the guest's attention. The visitors are well dressed, for the most part, but it's unclear what they have gathered here for. Nobody seems to be particularly interested in the art pieces on the walls, and the atmosphere is... polite. Unnaturally so. Many guests, turns to, many guests turn to look at you, and the stranger who brought you here, their glances are... varied. You see open contempt on a few faces, and animated interest on others. Most of the eyes in the room qual quietly, calmly observe you, as if wishing to appraise your worth. This reminds you of your company meetings. You, the only woman in the room, silently judge not on her merits, but her standing on the list. Passed in clandestine email threads between your male co-workers, until HR found out, that is. Not the most pleasant experience, but there's no denying it taught you resilience. When others would cower, you now straighten up. When others would turn their gaze, you meet the eyes of the gallery's guests with confidence. The woman. Ooh, uh, this may be Kadir? Uh, please forgive me if I mispronounce this. Good evening, Kadir. And to you, child. The noble, cold voice takes you out of your head and back to the situation in hand. The gallery, a crowd of strangers. You being brought here against your will. Whoops. Skipped a little bit there. You being brought here against your will. For what purpose? The room awaits your response. Good evening, miss. Good evening, miss. You're addressing the Prince of New York City, Helena Pannard, child of Michaela. Ooh, the Sheriff Farino. Thank you, my Sheriff, but I am capable of introducing myself. She is somewhat plain looking and doesn't seem to possess a great deal of charm, but still the entire room is intently focused on her voice. She has influence over these people, that much is clear. You may address me as Prince, child. I realize your introduction into one life was abrupt, and I understand your sire left shortly after. The rules of our society dictate I punish you both for this transgression. A murmur of agreement, maybe, can be heard from the gathered audience. But I am willing to listen to what our loyal sheriff has to say about the circumstances of your embrace first. I'm gonna keep my heckin' mouth shut. You decide it's best to stay silent and listen to this whole situation unfold. It feels like you're out of your depth here. Shall we begin? You are about to be judged by the court of New York City. Kadir, please tell us how you found this fledgling and what happened on your way here. Court? Prince? Is this some kind of secret society make-believe? A trusted informant who has chosen to remain anonymous at this time tipped me off about a suspicious kindred appearing in one of our domains. Upon investigating, I found them gone, but this fledgling remained in their place. A reservation made in the private lounge of the patrician suggests this one sire had plenty of resources to spend. However, they are apparently also well connected. I lost track of them. 
Despite some reservations, she offered little resistance last night and cooperated on our way to the safe house. I was pleased to not have to force her compliance. Opening the door to the safe house tonight, I was greeted by a most disturbing sight of her drenched and regurgitated blood. Apparently, the bag supply we kept in the fridge was not to her liking. The remark elicits a contemptuous chuckle from one of the gathered guests as they note the remains of the blood on your skirt. It was not an elegant sight, but that hardly matters, I suppose. Moving on. We had a quick chat, but wishing to appear here post-haste, I urged her to join me, which she did without struggle. A pleasant departure from my usual routine, I must say. During our drive here, she showed me her fangs, metaphorically speaking, posturing as if we were equals, insulting me when it didn't work. I refrained from causing her physical harm, but I expect her ego might still be a bit bruised. He looks at you and flashes a nasty smile. The story ends with us arriving at Elysium tonight. All eyes are on you again. You take a special interest in one of the faces. It's a beautiful woman with curly, almost blood-red hair and a dress to match. You see her whispering to some bespectacled man with an absent-minded look on his face. Who is she, you wonder? Thank you, Kadir. I take note of this fledgling's behavior and will take it into consideration later. She turns her attention to you. First, there is the matter of your sire. The person who brought you where Kadir picked you up from last night. Who were they? A handsome businessman. An entrepreneur, a quaint of my boss, I think. Good looking, pale blue eyes and some gray in his hair. Charming, abusive, cold son of a bitch. You feel tired and angry. This whole situation, spending the day in some underground parking lot, having to bear the looks of a room full of strangers. It's almost too much to take in stride. There's no reason you should take it all in stride, but you do. Because if there's one thing your professional career has taught you, it's that. All because of that asshole, whoever he was. He never even gave you a name or a card. Nothing. Well, Kadir, does that sound familiar? No, it does not. At least not familiar enough. I will continue the search after we're done here. That man, he talked to somebody at the restaurant before he left. I can't remember what he said, but he wasn't alone. Maybe that's the lead you can follow. Did he now? That is interesting. I do hope the proprietor won't stay mad at us for losing one of his staff. It's almost like he knows the waiter's fate is still bothering you, and takes pleasure in pointing it out. Thank you for that observation. I will investigate it. Later. What shall I do with the fledgling, my prince? What is your recommendation, my sheriff? The traditions are clear. Thou shalt only sire another with the permission of thine elder. If thou createst another with thine elders, without thine elders' leave, both thou and thy progeny shall be slain. I am ready to fulfill my duty. Stay your hand for just a moment longer, Kadir. I wish to consult my counsel on this. Make sure everyone is in agreement. Of course. He seems strangely relieved. The prince leaves the main showroom, and a handful of people follow her out. You're about to ask this Kadir what all that talk of tradition Attention. and council was. Being followed. Shall I dispatch the welcoming drones? Oh, hello. How are you? We're getting into the thick of it here in the plot. 
You're about to ask this Kadir what all that talk of traditions and councils was when the red-haired woman approaches the two of you. Sophie. Ooh, what's her voice like? Sheriff, I was wondering if I could have a word with the fleshling. What for? My range is not fantastic, folks, so some of these voices may sound very similar. I apologize in advance. She lowers her voice in response. Come now, Kadir. We all know what the verdict is going to be. Let me speak to them. You might not have a stain on your hands tonight, after all. Her words grab his attention. His face is hard to read. It's like several emotions are struggling for domination. Anger, sadness, hope, gratitude, resolve. I'll go get my sword. He steps out of the room the way you came, and you are left in the showroom with the woman in the red dress. The lady in red. Maybe she'll dance with me. She takes you aside, and the eyes of the remaining guests follow you. Well then, fledgling, you are in quite the pickle. What do you mean? What do you mean? I, I still don't understand why my crime is here. Poor thing. This really isn't your fault, but if you want to get out of here in one piece, you need to understand one crucial fact that seems to have eluded your grasp. Last night, you became a vampire. Wait, what? Oh yes, uh, I am well aware of how ridiculous that sounds. It's the reason why we have all these nicer words for it. Kindred, being embraced, having a sire. The fact remains. The beings called vampires, you're looking at them. They're us. You glance around. Some of the guests are still occasionally looking at you commenting on you in hushed tones. Many of the patrons are pale. Really pale. Most hold glasses of wine. No, not wine. That's not the right thickness and not the right color either. You're trying to come up with something sensible to say, but you're drawing a blank. It makes a morbid kind of sense. You drank blood last night. There's no denying it. And your breathing has not returned. Your heart remains still. A vampire. Two voices in your head start battling for supremacy. One of them slowly begins to put everything that happened since yesterday together, coming to a conclusion that no matter how insane it might seem, nothing but what she's saying makes sense. The other voice just keeps saying, What the fuck? What the fuck? On repeat. You're surprised. This is often how it plays out by design. Kadir deliberately keeping you in the dark and all. If we do nothing, you will be cut down as sure as day follows night. But I'm here to offer you a chance. I'll wait out. Under one condition. I will take you under my wing. If you're lucky, the prince will be in a good mood tonight, and Kadir's complaints about your behavior won't influence her judgment. The society values docility. She might agree to this, but only if you swear fealty to me. I am not making this offer lightly. As your patron, I will take responsibility for you. Your actions will reflect on me. If they reflect negatively, well, I will make sure you face the consequences. How will you convince the prince? You're saying the prince might have other plans for me? What will you offer to convince her? You'll see it yourself, hopefully. Know this. There are certain traditions and a history of our society in this city that I can tap into. My word might not carry that much weight, but it is not easily ignored either.
Oh, hello, Kyle. Uh, this is Vampire the Masquerade, Quarteries of New York. Yeah, it's uh, almost like a little visual novel -y type thing. Steps and hushed voices can be heard from the side room. It seems the prince and her council are returning to the showroom. Kadir appears from downstairs as well and starts walking towards you. When you hear the verdict, ask to be spared. I will intervene. Remember my condition. She flashes a heart-melting smile towards Kadir, who does not smile back. The sheriff's immaculate suit is now complemented by a curved, oriental-looking metal scabbard, fastened with a colorful sash around his waist. Yeah, let me know if the voice gets weird again. Um, I think the, the sound settings are okay, but I'm not sure since I'm not like hearing the stream end of it. It would look vaguely ridiculous if it wasn't surprisingly intimidating, first and foremost. Kadir takes his place next to you and observes that the prince takes center stage again. Loyal kindred of the New York City Camarilla gathered here tonight. I have made my decision regarding this fledgling. Their behavior since being embraced has been disagreeable, and that does not bode well for them becoming a valuable member of our society. You are all keenly aware that these knights we need to close our ranks, and trust the wisdom of our elders and their traditions more than ever before. As our trusted sheriff pointed out, there can be only one course of action. Although I acknowledge some of my council's divergent opinions on this. She takes a look specifically at one of the people Attention. who left the room before. We are being followed. Shall I dispatch the welcoming drones? Oh, Bran, hello. Thank you for the follow. She takes a look specifically at one of the people who left the room before. A somewhat plainly dressed, shy looking man whose skin has a somewhat healthier tone. He bows his head in deference. I hold the final authority over this fledgling's fate, and I declare that while their embrace might be the sire's responsibility, in their absence it is their progeny that shall be punished. The sentence is final death, to be resolved presently. Kadir? You hear a scraping sound and see that the sheriff has unsheathed his curved sword. It is a beautifully detailed blade, which you expect must be worth a small fortune. Its apparent sharpness makes you freeze up. Two outs, bottom of the ninth. His quiet mumble is audible to nobody but you. As his eyes meet yours, you know just a hint of sadness in his countenance one that quickly vanishes to give way to grim determination. And he's out to bat. You will not get another chance to speak up. No, we have a plan. Don't you worry. You make your choice. Spare me, please. Don't make me bad, good. God damn it. Prince, if I may ask you to stay the sheriff's hand for a while longer. Kadir looks at the prince, awaiting her response. The sword is still hanging above you, threatening to fall at a moment's notice. Is there something you'd like to say, Miss Langley? Yes, if I may. At first, the prince looks somewhat annoyed at the distraction, but she stays quiet for a while, measuring the mood in the room. The board elites suddenly look at you with aroused interest, some of them dismayed at not seeing the bloodshed, but all intrigued by the unexpected twist. The prince nods. Well, let's hear it. Sophie takes a few steps forward 
All eyes are on her now, but Kadir's heavy hand on your shoulder makes it clear you won't take advantage of the distraction. My prince, while the traditions are clear, I believe that the proper context should be observed in addition to the letter of our laws. This fledgling is a burden, but with proper guidance, they could become an asset to our domain. And I understand you are volunteering to take this unruly child under your protection. I will note, they keep calling me unruly, but I was perfectly pleasant the entire time up to arriving at Elysium. I gave the sheriff some lip, but I wasn't anywhere near as bad as I could have been. Anyway, yes, I am willing to give them a chance and prove to the entire domain that they can adhere to our expectations. I will take nothing less than their full cooperation, naturally. Whispers can be heard again. An incredulous voice or two, a hushed, just behead the fucker. Some suppressed exclamations of surprise. Silence. I ask all of you to make a note of this moment. I might be persuaded to bend one tradition in this child's favor, but another will have to be enforced even more firmly in its stead. Until thy progeny shall be released, thou shalt command them in all things. Their sins are thine to endure. Are you certain that's a responsibility you wish to shoulder, Miss Langley? Ms. Miss Langley. I am willing to guide this fletchling and add a valuable ally to our sect in a time of need. Yes. But I would like to receive the right of destruction over them, if it pleases you. I'm playing against type a little bit here. This is, uh, Charlotte here is a Ventru that knows the value of, uh, keeping up appearances, so she will remain silent. It's clear tensions are high. It feels surreal to listen to strangers discussing your death, or second death, apparently, and keeping silent. You decide it's for the best to let Sophie handle this alone and not interject. You have no idea how to handle this eyes white shut crowd. The prince looks at you as if weighing your worth. She takes another good measure of the room before she speaks again. I shall grant what you ask. Let it be known, Sophie Langley of the Clan of the Rose will become this fledgling's patron. They shall be considered like sire and child. Miss Langley will take full responsibility for them, and I grant her the right of destruction if she sees fit to use it. Oh, I thought Sophie uh, was a Ventru, but I guess Rose makes more sense. I gotta stop assuming things about other kindred. It's gonna get me into trouble. Let my intentions be clear, however. If I am to turn a blind eye to one of our most important traditions on this occasion, I expect it to be beneficial to the Camarilla. Substantially so. I hope you find this verdict satisfactory, Ms. Langley. Of course, Prince. Thank you. Very well. She turns to you. What is your name, child? Charlotte. Let's be polite. Charlotte, Prince. She nods. Ooh, dictionary's updated. We'll check that in a sec. Oh, Camarilla, probably. Welcome to the Camarilla, Charlotte. Now this evening proved to be even more eventful than I anticipated, but with the fledgling's fate decided, I believe our meeting here can conclude. Thank you all for appearing on such short notice. Give my regards to those who couldn't make it. Kadir, a moment of your time before I let you return to your duties. Of course, Prince. 
He shoots you a side glance that doesn't leave much space for interpretation. You will be watched. You will be judged. And if need be, you will be punished. The two of them leave the gallery. Well, Charlotte, I think we've both already managed to significantly improve each other's evenings. But let's keep the ball rolling, shall we? I think we should have a toast to a new fruitful partnership. She raises her hand at one of the well-dressed concierges, who have now reappeared in the showroom to refill the guest glasses. These S's are going to kill me. The conventionally handsome man approaches with a carafe, I believe that's how you say it, of red liquid. The memory of throwing up in the safe house is still fresh in your mind, but the idea that it could happen again is almost enough to reject the drink altogether. But there's no denying you want it. You need it. I remember what Kadir said about your misadventure before getting in the car. Some of us have more delicate palates than others. Try to stick... Try to stake. Oh gosh, Freudian slip there. Try to take a small sip. S'il vous plaît. He pours it into two tall glasses. You can barely wait until he hands you the drink. Your attention is fully on it. The fact that it's blood, you are certain of it, doesn't faze you this time. It's difficult to take just a sip. Even though the taste is as foul as before, you are tempted to down the whole glass in one go. You wait before taking a second taste. You're glad you did. A feeling like heartburn signals that you can't keep it down. You spit it back inside the glass. Sophie looks on, intrigued. I'm not surprised. NYC caterers have very bourgeoisie ideas about what good blood should taste like. Well, you just need to keep trying. At Sophie's request, the concierge serves you three other variants of blood. The first two are as horrible and undigestible as before, both ending up back in the glass within moments of tasting them. Before the third try, you are almost ready to throw the glass at the wall in frustration. But finally, this one's different. Instead of mud and decay, a surprisingly rich bouquet of tastes. You feel blissfully at ease, and Sophie takes notice. Ah! There it is. Jacob, would you kindly let us know who the donor was? Leave the bottle, please. The concierge... Ooh, more wines. The concierge nods and leaves again. You take another sip, and another. You empty the glass. The dull feeling in your stomach and head starts subsiding. But you still want more. Sophie pours you another glass and refills hers. She takes a sip. You have a curiously specific taste, Charlotte. Is it the clover notes, the traces of caffeine, or that bittersweet aftertaste of melancholy? You taste nothing of the kind, but it doesn't matter. It's tasty, but not as delicious as it was last night, not as intoxicating. It manages to silence the hunger somewhat, though. Drinking blood puts you at ease. It is a strange realization. The man named Jacob comes back with a small card and leaves it with Sophie. She takes a quick look and passes it on to you. It's somebody's medical details. An office worker, male, Caucasian, 32 years old. Blood type, ABRH positive. Blue eyes, brown hair, no history of substance use. New Jersey native. Oh, all right. Well, I got to know which part of Jersey because that matters. Might one, of the de what, bleh, might one of these details be what makes the difference? Now that we have picked up the right bouquet for your palate, these documents should be useful in identifying your exact taste. Should they be... ORH positive or Joyzy boys. 
Uh, nobody actually talks like that, Sophie. Come on. But I believe you have more questions, no? Perhaps we should start with those related to sustenance. How will I know what I can drink? These difficulties of mine, how do I navigate that? How will I know what kind of blood I can drink? It's a tricky question. I believe you will just have to trust your instinct on this. With time, you should be able to narrow down your particular preference. Blood that you reject is, of course, of no value to you, and it's a horrible waste. No amount of it will ever sate your hunger completely, but every little sip counts. If you're frugal or forced by the circumstances, you can survive many nights without a single drink, but it's risky and will tempt the beast. That is part of our curse. It will take some time to find the right balance. Tomorrow I shall take you hunting and we will explore this topic further, but you should be good for now. You mentioned the beast. Oh, let's do this first. What will you expect of me? So, now that I'm working for you, what are my responsibilities going to be like? It's a bit more complicated than working for me. If I wished for a servant, there were easier ways to achieve that than risking the prince's chagrin at Elysium. I can see potential in you that would have been wasted if I hadn't spoken up. Not to mention that it would pain me to witness a senseless final death. It always had. That said, I will require that you defer to me in all things, but me being your mentor and superior also means that I shall treat you as my loyal retainer and understudy. With me, you can go far. Without me and proper guidance, you would have become a clear danger to the masquerade. That is why, with your sire gone, the prince wanted you out of the picture, too. The concierge returns, asks for permission to intrude, which Sophie gives with a polite smile, and leans in to whisper in her ear. You note that the gallery is now almost empty. I'm being told the gallery is just about to close, but we still have quite a lot to discuss. We'll go to one of my apartments. My jalopy is waiting downstairs. Come. The smile she puts on could tip any negotiation towards her favor. Her words are like honey, and she makes it impossible to take your eyes off her. You are under her spell, momentarily. Ooh, more car scenes. I love how they have the gauge very clearly here in the rear view for the car scenes like this. Sophie leads you to a luxurious silver Rolls Royce and invites you to sit in the back. The chauffeur, a broad-shouldered, clean-shaving middle-aged guy, starts driving immediately. Where did we leave off? Uh, oh, I believe I started telling you a bit more about our customs. You've heard the prince refer to our traditions. The chief among them is the Masquerade. I like the title of the game. As you might have gathered from us assembling at a niche gallery after closing time, our comings, goings, and doings tend to be somewhat secretive. We do not advertise our existence. We allow myths and modern fiction to morph and muddle the facts. So to, so to the vast majority of kind, we remain bedtime stories and pop culture icons. Say, is that one television show about a vampire angel still popular? You shake your head in confusion. She shrugs and continues talking, looking a little bit more dejected than before. Our clandestine ways help us remain safe, allow us to explain away the occasional trip up to the rational minds of 21st century humanity, and dictate much of our interaction with mortals. What's the risk? What's the worst that could happen if you're a vampire? I'm sure you can defeat any threat that comes your way. 
It would surely make things easier if we could. Unfortunately for us, there are plenty of things that harm us. Chief among them are sunlight and fire. Both will burn you to ash. That's why we rest during the day. You felt it, I'm sure. That it's more like being dead than being dormant, but we have no choice. We are night dwellers, but day sleepers. Some more folk-related threats are just legends or occasionally a minor nuisance. Garlic, running water, or even religious symbols don't repel us unless the wielder is uniquely pure and godly. Stakes through the heart, though, that's something to avoid. They do not destroy, but they do paralyze, which under the right circumstances can often be the same thing. That's a reason to have somebody like my trusted driver, Gregory, making sure you're safe when you drift away. We have many enemies, and they often know their advantage lies with daylight. How can you trust your driver? Your driver must know who he works for, right? I mean, he's right there. Surely he can hear everything we're saying. How can you trust him to keep your secrets? His loyalty is assured by partaking of my blood, but his loyalty extends beyond just his just this dependency. I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you if you ask. It, it is a nice change of pace. Our little sex applies social interactions aplenty, but it doesn't really encourage counting on someone. Support given in exchange for favors, yes, that's more like it. Long-term solidarity does occur in the Camarilla, but we are a very politicized organization by necessity. Loyalty is to your sire, to your prince, and to the sect. When you're in Elysium, like we were tonight, the sect can appear to be a monolith. The reality is more complex. Outside of official gatherings, shady deals, and a quid pro quo mentality reign supreme. She seems to be lost in thought and falls silent for a while, leaving you to ponder all the things you've learned tonight. It still feels absolutely unreal, but as piece after piece of knowledge falls into place, the image becomes almost like an entirely logical jigsaw puzzle. Whatever you wouldn't believe on your own, You've witnessed. Many questions swarm your thoughts, but the one you keep returning to is what your place in this new reality should be. The car stops. You are in the city, in front of an old but well-renovated apartment building. We're here. Would you like to see your lodgings? My own apartment? Neat. I get my own apartment. That's neat. Consider it the first of many gifts that I'm able to grant in exchange for loyalty. Come upstairs. She leads you through a small hall with a night guard who greets Ms. Langley with a good evening, and you take the stairs up to the second floor. Sophie opens the door to room 209. Inside are all the amenities you could expect from a modern apartment, and some you wouldn't have deemed necessary just the previous night, including thick blinds on the windows. 
The back room has a comfortable looking bed and a thick steel door with several sturdy looking locks. But no windows. Well, how do you like it? We'll keep being polite. This is great, thank you. I'm glad. Make yourself at home. Tomorrow I will take you hunting and discuss the blood in more detail. I'll let you get comfortable. The keys are by the television set. I will come pick you up tomorrow night. Use the back room for rest. You can lock the doors just in case. It stings a bit when she leaves. It's like the room suddenly became a few shades dimmer. You inspect the kitchen, hoping to find something to drink. Nothing. No regular food, either. Oh, I thought I had chat alerts up in this thing. I gotta fix that. Uh, run a Steam Among Us game. You mean like uh, run it on like my stream or just like host range or something? It feels strange that Kadir could be a more thoughtful host than your new side. Even if only in that respect, you briefly wonder if the sheriff might have a hidden side. With nothing left to do, you lie on the couch with the TV playing in the background for company. Columbo reruns. Kojak reruns. I don't know Kojak. President of the United States got himself into serious trouble again. Orange is sus, vote him out. President of the United States. President of the United States got himself out of trouble again. <laughs> Pundits start yelling over each other about things that seemed a little bit less insignificant just two days ago. You start drifting off, reflecting about another night of confusing conversations and worldview shattering revelations. How many more before you finally understand what happened to you, and what you're supposed to do now? You keep coming back to the life you left behind. The people you should contact, the things you want to pick up from your apartment. You wonder when you'll have the chance for either. As you start to feel the same tiredness that made you drift into a cold sleep, into a cold sleep last night, you settle back, you settle in the back room. The bed is comforting, the lack of windows, less so. You leave the light bulb on, looking at it, you realize it's the closest you'll ever come to staring at the sun on a breezy summer day again. A wave of melancholy overwhelms you. A few minutes later, your consciousness fades and you take the plunge into darkness again. Sinking, 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 sinking. Ooh, okay. I guess, is this where we would have like side activities? Um, I know this is like the chat log in case you missed something. This book here is a dictionary, so let's go through. Um, oh, let's go, the Camarilla. A major sect of vampires devoted primarily to maintaining the masquerade through influence and manipulation of mortal society. The Fletchlight. A newly created vampire still under their sire's protection. Prince. A vampire who has claimed a given expanse of domain as their own, generally a city, and supports that claim against all others. The term can refer to a kindred of either sex. The hunger. The urge to feed. For vampires, the hunger replaces all other drives with its own powerful call. The beast. The inchoate drives and urges that threaten to turn a vampire into a mindless, ravening monster. Elysium. 
a place where vampires may gather without fear of harm. Court functions in Elysium are strictly kept apart from mortals and surrounded by secrecy, but the Elysium building itself could be a public museum, a gallery, or a club. Bergain is an anarch Elysium. The Lou is a Camrilla Elysium. Final death. When a vampire ceases to exist, crossing the line from undeath into true death. The Masquerade. The habit or tradition of hiding the existence of vampires from humanity. Designed to protect vampires from destruction at the hands of mankind. The Masquerade was adopted after the Medieval Inquisition claimed many kindred on lives. I appreciate that consistency. Sire, a vampire's begetter, the kindred who created them. The Traditions The six traditions form the core framework for governance among the kindred. The first tradition, the Masquerade. Thou shalt not reveal thy true nature. The second tradition, the Domain. Thy domain is thine own concern. All others owe thee respect while in it. The third tradition, the progeny. Thou shalt only sire another with the permission of thine elder. The fourth, the accounting. Though thou create are thine own children, their sins are thine to endure. The fifth tradition, hospitality. Honor one another's domain. Without the word of acceptance, thou art nothing. The sixth tradition, destruction. Thou art forbidden to destroy another of thy kind. The right of destruction belongeth only to thine elder. Okay, let's rest and see what happens. Alright, so it looks like we're still in tutorial land. Hunger is at the heart of... Oh. Hunger is at the heart of a vampire's existence. To ignore it is to tempt the beast to take over in its desire to feed. To overindulge in feeding may threaten the masquerade while staining what humanity you have left. I don't see them warning about us diablery though, so... That's still on the table. In coteries of New York, having high hunger is indicated by a progressively thicker, bloody frame around the screen, like the one you see now. As your hunger grows, so does this indicator. Your hunger may increase when you call upon your vampiric powers, or when you need to mend your wounds after a fight. When your hunger reaches the maximum level, you will receive a warning after you complete a piece of the story. Ignore it at your own peril. Some choices might only become visible if your hunger is high enough. Similarly, high hunger may block off some choices, as you will be able to see after pressing continue. To decrease your hunger, you will need to feed. Whenever you see a feeding opportunity, you can take the risk to hunt and slake your hunger. You will need to keep the hunger at bay if you are to uphold the masquerade and survive the nights that await you. You open your eyes. The bed isn't warm. The room is filled with artificial light from the ceiling. The solid metal door is closed. Normally, you'd stretch for a bit. On some mornings, you'd probably throw the quilt over yourself and snooze a moment longer. But that was before. The way you woke up now, you are fully conscious. I keep saying conscious. Conscious. No grogginess. Nothing weighing you down. Just a bagging need in the back of your head. Hunger. Not as severe as the last time, but unmistakably there. You get up and open the door to the main room. A digital clock on the TV shows you the time. 9.04 p.m. You walk over to the blinds and retract them cautiously. The only light coming is in is NYC's natural artificial nighttime luminescence. So that's what your waking hours are going to look like now. 
You missed the sunlight already. You're seriously considering just walking out of the apartment and figuring this all out by yourself. But then you come back to the memory of Kadir's exotic sword being raised in the gallery. Maybe sticking around isn't that bad of an idea after all. You keep jumping channels for around half an hour and then switch to streaming services. Almost as if the universe had a sense of irony, you catch true blood and the flood of recommendations. And the doorbell rings. It's Sophie. Good evening, Charlotte. Slept well? Like a dead man. Like a dead man. Curious wording, but not that far from the truth, I suppose. No use dwelling on it. I think you will agree. It's time. You made the right choice yesterday. I can teach you many things about yourself. Your blood, its desires, and its power. We will begin tonight. You are hungry, yes? I'm sure you are. Our kind always is. There's only one remedy. The blood. The drinks we had yesterday at Elysium are not the usual way you slake your thirst. So tonight, I will assist you in your first foray into hunting. You will need to learn to sense the kind of blood you desire. To understand how you can use the kind's vulnerabilities to your advantage. Uh, we haven't gotten that dictionary entry yet, but kind uh, is kind of like a euphemism for our humans. Predator and prey, huh? Grim. Hmm, little too smart assy. Uh, I'm ready to learn. Well, I'm ready to learn. Let's get started. Such eagerness, or is it just your hunger making you impatient? You will find that drinking moderate amounts of it regularly will keep the hunger and the whispers of the beast away. You might think yourself monstrous, but there is a balance to be found here. The kiss gives the kind pleasure. You might remember this from your own embrace. Some can even become addicted to the sensation. But if you do it right, they tend to misremember your feeding. Alright, I need to get some water, so I'm just going to pop to the Be Right Back screen very quickly for a second.
Okay, folks, uh, we are back, and yes, Brian, uh, the music is amazing. My friend, uh, Ryan was kind enough to put together, to put it together for me. Um... I, I'll shut him out again on Twitter, in case you happen to see it. Alright. Oh, I think our levels are good. Here we go. After all, vampires do not exist. They are myths, fairy tales, and pop culture mainstays, correct? She gives you a sly, knowing smile. That is why the masquerade is so important, and even more crucial when you feed. How do you select the victim? How do I choose who to feed from? Are there better or worse uh, targets? Isolated kind or easiest prey, of course, but much depends on context. Hunting requires a different approach in a busy club than it does on an empty street. With time, you will have the luxury of finding your preference in hunting methods and prey. For now, I suggest experimenting in moderation. Feeding from the same area repeatedly can be dangerous, but by branching out, you risk the ire of other kindred on whose domains you would trespass. Lucky for you, NYC is more forgiving in this regard. New York is in somewhat of a unique position. Many of its neighborhoods remain contested or unclaimed. The reason for this is a lesson for another time, but keep the following in mind. Take opportunities to feed when they present themselves these upcoming nights. As long as you hunt cautiously and respect the masquerade at all times, you should be fine. To wit, I want you to join me for a trip tonight. Come downstairs, Gregory is waiting for us. The busy street fills the air with traffic noise, pedestrian chatter, and a mix of smells that disorient you momentarily. These warm bodies contain what you want, what you need. You catch yourself. Did you really just think of these people as mere sources of blood? Hell yeah. It takes a nudge from Sophie to break your train of thought. Her driver opens the door for her, and then tips his hat to you, gesturing to the back of the car. We'll find then, Gregory. Greg. The car casually joins the somewhat thin New York traffic. It's still busy in a way only one of the biggest cities in the world can be, but compared to the daytime commute, it's a pleasant drive. Oh gosh, I can't imagine, like, driving in New York City. You barely have time, you barely have the time to gather your thoughts and formulate new questions before the car comes to a stop. You're among the tall skyscrapers that make up Manhattan's iconic skyline. Come Charlotte, park the car Gregory, will you? The driver just nods and Sophie gets out. You join her and the two of you walk through the glass doors together, then take the elevator up. You first notice an empty stage with the instruments of a string quartet still in the back, then take in the few dozen chairs in front of it. Oh, Toreadors. The concert seeming concluded, the patrons, all smartly dressed and posh, have spread out all over the hall. Sophie strides confidently inside, produces an invitation from her purse, that she flashes in front of a security guard. You follow close and are let through without issue. Let's start easy. A social setting like this one would usually prove quite challenging to an inexperienced kindred, but consider this evening a small gift from your patron. I'm hoping to procure for you a willing vessel. Just remember what I told you about taking small sips. This one I have a soft spot for. Don't damage her. Now let's see here. Ah, there he is. 
she notices somebody in the crowd, flashes a heart-melting smile, and suddenly even you feel drawn to her. You haven't thought about this before, but it's laid clear before you in this moment. Sophie is beautiful. Just looking at her is a privilege. Just being with her makes you feel elated. Everybody in the crowd, but especially the man who's almost tripping over himself to reach her, clearly agrees. Edgar, I'm so happy to see you. How is your daughter? Is she with you? Oh, there she is. Julie, my girl, come over, please. There is somebody I'd like you to meet. The young woman who walks across the hall can't be more than 19 years old. It's clear from her mismatched earrings and the partially faded purple hair dye that she doesn't fit this crowd. Julie, this is Charlotte. I think the two of you should get acquainted while I talk business with your dad. Awfully boring stuff, I assure you. I'm positive you'll like each other. The girl gives you a shy smile and nods towards the balcony stairs. You follow, somewhat unsure of what it is exactly Sophie expects you to do. You reach a secluded space from which the entire lobby is visible. All eyes are on Sophie. They listen intently, then laugh when she does. Julie saves you the trouble of figuring out the next step. If you're with Sophie, then I guess you're, uh... I mean, that you... You know. She puts her wrist to her lips and gives herself a theatrical nip. Then looks to you. Embarrassed, but also hopeful. Ah, uh, are we gonna tease her or just be upfront about it. Mm. Uh, this sounds more accusatory than teasing, so let's just go in. Yes. Yes, I do. She takes off her jacket, unbuttons her sleeve, then rolls it up. You see a tattoo of a cat in an astronaut suit. One feline eye winking at you. There. Just enjoy. Uh, j -Ville, uh, I started off with the Ventru Lady. I'm a little disappointed that, uh, you know, my roots here, Malkavian, are not being represented, but I thought I'd play against type and go for the Blue Bloods. A perfectly awkward smile and a blush. Hell yeah, we're drinking. This is why we're here. You take her forearm in your hands. A quick look around confirms nobody's watching, and no security cameras cover this area. You bite down. Gently. It's surreal. She's just given you her blood of her own volition. How is this possible? What about the masquerade? You need to ask Sophie. You tear away from her. A brief convulsion shakes you. Her smell, it's her smell, it's not right. The temporary feeling of bliss the girl felt when you bit her is gone in an instant. She's disappointed, annoyed even. She looks at you unsure of what's the matter. Come back please, just have some more. Just a little bit more. The very thought makes you want to throw up what little of her blood you've tasted. You shake your head. The girl sniffs, starts crying, wipes her face into her jacket sleeve, and walks down the stairs and into the hall. The crowd around Sophie disperses slowly. Looking at her now, only some residual awe hangs in the air. Ah, puns. Yes, she's pretty, maybe even beautiful, sure, but not your type. What came over you before? You walk over to her. Edgar, dear, it was a splendid it was splendid talking to you, but we need to get going. Give Julie my best wishes. Come with Charlotte. Gregory is waiting for you out front. It's only in the car that Sophie addresses you. So, how did it go? 
I tried, but yeah. We're gonna be honest with our patron until we have a good enough reason to lie. I tried, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't stand the smell. Or the taste. Curious. I consider Julie's blood to have one of the most exquisite and unique bouquets in the city, and trust me, I have refined taste. She almost sounds like she's offended. Oh well. If at first you don't succeed, perhaps you need a change of pace. Time for the next stop. Training wheels off this time. Gregory, Flushing Meadows, please. The driver takes the car over the Williamsburg Bridge. Hey, Williamsburg, my old haunt. You settle your thoughts. What did you do to the people back there? Those people back at the hall, they were all entranced. Even I was under your spell. What was that? She smiles with satisfaction. That old trick? Just the blood doing my bidding. We all have our talents. Some of them come from the legacy we inherit from our sire. Others can be learned with experience. I can sway people or make them fear me. I see more of the world in a greater detail than some kindred. I can will my body to move with unparalleled precision and grace. And more. All of these skills make me who I am. They also help me hunt. What are my powers? Okay, so what are my talents? Time will tell. You need to discover them yourself. When we arrive, experiment. Give different things a try. Follow your instinct and intuition. It will guide the blood. Always keep the masquerade in mind, however. It is all fine if you can disappear in plain sight or command animals with your mind, but save those over our talents for the right place and time. It only takes you half an hour to reach the park at this time of night. Both you and Sophie leave the car, with Gregory left behind again to find a parking spot and keep an eye on the car. Sophie seems deep in thought. She takes in the surroundings with a dreamy gaze. The sky is surprisingly clear tonight. The stars just barely visible in the light polluted aura of the city. I feel like having a snack myself. I'll be by the fountain. Go, look for someone to your liking. See what effects you can achieve with your blood, but only pick one victim, just one, then come back. Seeing how she seems not altogether here right now, you decide to leave Sophie to her own devices and seek out your prey. From here, it looks like you have a few choices. Just taking a stroll around the park and finding an isolated jogger or someone like them could work, but focusing on one area might work better. The New York State Pavilion might work as a secluded spot. There's a skate park nearby, and worst case scenario, there's bound to be some unfortunate wino around. Or maybe the tennis courts nearby. There's light coming from there, so somebody might still be playing a late night match. They won't be alone, but they might be tired and let their guard down. As these scenarios play out in your mind, you realize you're planning how to assault a stranger in the middle of the night. It's a weird way to be, but the now familiar hunger prompts you to act. All right, well, we're ventral. Let's look for a tennis aficionado. You decide the tennis courts are as good a place as any and make your way to the bright glow of the lamps illuminating the area. 
As you guessed, a pair of players, two men, fit but older, maybe pushing 60, are finishing up a match. They are the only ones there. It's time to make a move. Part into the shower, you presents. Now nah, let's go with presents. I can't tell if this is supposed to be fortitude or just regular physical power, but let's do power. Lure player away. You think back to what Sophie did in the hall, how she managed to focus the attention of the entire gathering on her. That might be a tall order for you, but a single person could be doable. You wait patiently until the two men hit the showers, get out, and say their goodbyes. They go their separate ways, and one of them notices you standing there. You immediately grab his attention. Good evening. Hmm. Now let's be convivial. Let's have a conversation before I crunch. Oh yes, very good. You? Oh yeah, I'm having a blast. You? What both sets? Not bad for a grandpa. He's clearly very happy with himself. You decide there won't be a better moment to strike, moving closer, casually at first, then closing the distance in a single leap, you sink your fangs into his flesh. It only takes a sip for you to realize your mistake. A taste of mud and bile fills your throat a second time tonight. You push the man away, he stumbles and falls to the ground. You can barely believe your luck. The hunger in you unsated, you leave the courts in a foul mood. As you're about to walk back to Sophie, a figure emerges from the shadows and stops you in your tracks. A hooded man is looking menacingly at you. Oh, a hoodlum complete with an I Heart Beer tattoo. What do you think you're doing barging in on my turf like this? Lick. Lick is a pejorative for kindred. What kind of slur is that? What did you call me? A lick? What is that supposed to mean? Don't be cute with me. I know what you are. Shove that masquerade bullshit up your ass. Better tell me who you're with before my posse shows up and we beat it out of you. I don't know if I want to name drop her yet. Uh, probably safer to do it. I'm here with Sophie Langley. I came here with Sophie Langley. She's my patron. Doesn't ring a bell. Sounds fancy though. He licks his lips, exposing his fangs and looking at you voraciously. A nervous tick or an attempt at intimidation? I wonder, what would Callahan do to you if I brought you in? Break your shins? Leave you out to be kissed by the sun? Ooh, concrete shoes. Maybe. He's old school like that. Oh, yeah, let's start working on that dominate. Enough's enough. You won't be intimidated by this asshole. Leave. Now. His countenance changes. A cruel beast one moment, a humbled pup the next. He walks away. Just like that. How did you do it? Not wishing to tempt fate any further, you return to the Unisphere looking back over your shoulder to make sure you're not being followed. If you hear the pitter-patter, those are my doggos. Two figures are visible near the sculpture, a man and a woman, tangled in a passionate embrace. No, not exactly. It's Sophie, feeding. 
But this whole scene is set up so that it looks like a couple getting intimate in public. She pulls it off like she's done that a hundred times before. It occurs to you that she probably has. The man is unsure on his feet as she lets go of him and leads him towards a nearby bench. Noticing you, she whispers something into his ear and leaves him. Her driver appears from behind the tree. Well, Charlotte, how did it go? You're about to answer when the same figure as before emerges from one of the alleys. He looks at the three of you and a predatory smile creeps onto his lips. Oh, it's the hoodlum again. You're screwed, dumb fuck. You think you can mess with my hat and get away with it? Think you'll be safe with your friends? Well, I have friends, too. He makes a motion to shout, but two things happen almost at the same time. First, that feeling of warmth and beauty emanating from Sophie flares up again, entrancing both you and the hooded thug. His shout comes out as a weak, confused squeak. Second, Gregory produces a wooden stake from a holster under his jacket and slams it into the thug's chest. Just like that, in a few seconds, the posturing vampire is down on the ground, paralyzed.
I see you made a friend, Charlotte. Curious choice of company, I would say. Who is he? He said something about presenting me to somebody named Callahan. Ever heard of him? She looked shocked for a split second, then recovered her usual countenance. Yes, I have. This hoodlum is Anarch, then. Curious. Corona Park has not been claimed by any kindred last I checked. Let's go to the car. We'll put him in the trunk and present him to Kadir tomorrow night. I'm sure he'll be delighted to make the Sunbound's acquaintance. Gregory carries the staked vampire and dumps him in the car's trunk like a mannequin. It's a strange sight, and you're quite happy you're not in that poor fucker's shoes right now. It's almost surprising you can get away with just casually throwing a stiff into your car and driving away, but then you remember that Sophie has been doing this far longer than you have. Still, the nagging thought that anything you did tonight could have been recorded on a CCTV camera or picked up by a rando with a half-decent smartphone and streamed online fills you with dread. Hunting and using your abilities is a dangerous business. It's clear that this whole being a vampire thing has about as many caveats as it has perks. You're taken out of your headspace by Sophie's voice. I will pick you up tomorrow night, same as tonight. I have some business to attend to at Elysium, and I expect you to accompany me. Plus, our friend in the back needs to be properly introduced to Kadir and the Prince. I'm sure he'll have some interesting things to say to the court. Her voice is cold, cruel, and nothing like the enchanting personality she showed at the gallery earlier tonight. Sophie is clearly a woman of many faces. What's going to happen to him? The usual, I imagine. Interrogation by Kadir, probably in the basement of the gallery. A quick trial with the prince in attendance, if she's there tomorrow night. A swift execution at the verdict. This all sounds really familiar to you, and you can't help but feel a pang of guilt when you think about what awaits this guy tomorrow. You haven't told me how your hunting went. Getting the hang of it, I would hope? I tried, but the blood was awful. My picky tastes flared up again. I couldn't make myself drink from that man, even though I did bite him. That is unfortunate. I'm afraid I don't have a ready-made solution for this. You'll need to trust your instincts. The sooner you learn what it is you're looking for in a vessel, the better. She seems distracted, not all there. Her thoughts drift and the car remains silent until you reach your apartment. We will pick you up tomorrow evening. Good night. Just like that, without any further courtesy, Sophie leaves, driven to her apartment by Gregory, with a body in the trunk right in the middle of Manhattan. Did you cross paths with situations like these in the past, unknowingly? What other secrets did you pass on the streets without knowing their true nature? Your haven is just as you left it hours ago. Although the sun won't come up for some time, you feel tired. You learned something about yourself today, and it'll take time to process. You're not in the mood for television, and the few books on the shelves in the apartment are either in languages you don't speak or sound like a boring read. Nothing left to do but rest. You settle in the back room, lock the door. A moment of hesitation, but then a decision. This time, you turn the light off. You think back to Julie. How many people in this city know about this vampiric society? How many are willing accomplices in sustaining it? 
and the thug you met in the park. If he's not Camarilla, then what is he? Are there independent vampires? How does that work? More questions. You begin wondering if there's ever going to be a night when you can start crossing them off the list, instead of adding to it. You close your eyes. You sink into the now familiar void of nothingness. It greets you with open arms, like an old friend. Okay, here we go. I guess this is night three, so we're heading into night three now. You open your eyes. It's pitch dark here. The blackness of a coffin drifting in the abyss. Oh, right. The light. You grasp the switch, flip it. The familiar cramped room with a steel door and no windows comes into view. You emerge from the bedroom fully awake, just like yesterday. This time, however, Sophie is waiting for you, comfortably seated on the sofa in your living room space, a book in her hand, The Melancholy of Resistance. The title is sure on brand. Good evening, Charlotte. Let's keep being polite. Sorry to have kept you waiting. To be fair, I haven't been here long. I was enjoying reminiscing about the time when I called this my haven. The decor was much different, of course. Come, we have an appointment. I received word Elysium would be called again tonight on account of your unruly friend from Corona Park. This should be a great opportunity for you to mingle. She keeps talking as you walk downstairs and get in the car. Gregory gives you a slight nod and a small smile while opening the door for Sophie. He starts the car when you take your seat in the back. Most of the Primogen Council is bound to be there, at least those who usually attend. Probably some other important personalities. You do well to at least learn about. How should I carry myself when inside? That's an important conduct question. You never told me if there's any, uh, Savoir Vive. I'm pronouncing that wrong. It's Savor of Life, I just don't know how to pronounce the French. Savoir Vive? Kind of rules I should respect when talking to other vampires. Knowing that you're among your superiors is probably the most important. In our society, status comes with age. Pardon my sincerity, but you are insignificant. Not even associating with me can make the fact that you've been kindred for barely a few nights be forgotten. So know your place, stay out of your superior's business, and show the utmost respect. Thanking the prince for sparing you, and maybe having a friendly chat with Kadir publicly, might show your gratefulness for being a part of the Camarilla now. I would suggest you make it sincere. At any rate, you should behave yourself tonight. Remember what I told you about reflecting on me as your patron. I have a reputation to uphold in the court. Do not tarnish it. There it is. She might have saved you. She might be protecting and teaching you. But it's clear what she's really concerned about. Her own interests. You step into the art hole. Correctly. With something of a bad memory. The last time you were here, your entire world had been turned upside down and your existence nearly ended. But tonight, there is very little outward hostility. Let me know if the game audio is too loud. Yes, Kadir gives you a look that's definitely intended to remind you of your place, but the prince, also in attendance, seems pleased to see you. Welcome, Sophie. Charlotte. Did I get that right? Good evening to both of you. I understand there is somebody else who wished to present to the court tonight. Yes, Prince, they will be joining us shortly. My assistant is retrieving them presently. This better be worth the Prince's time, Langley. 
The prince gives Kadir a cold glance. Forgive the sheriff's harshness. He's in a particularly foul mood tonight. Something to do with Charlotte's begetter eluding his grasp, I believe. Ouch. That must have hurt his ego. Even if his only reply is a crooked smile. The mention of your sire makes you grit your teeth in anger. Asshole. Settling you with a curse that cut off your career, cheated you out of your ambitions, offering little in return so far. You remind yourself that defeatism will get you nowhere. Mindfulness, the here and now. This is an opportunity. You will make the most of it, if only to spite everyone who doubts your true worth. Spoken like a true venture. The flaring up of whispers in the gallery hall breaks you out of your thoughts. Gregory enters the room. The jumpsuit clad, inert vampire still staked on his shoulder. The show is about to start. Sophie's driver places his charge in the middle of the room and nods respectfully to Kadir. The sheriff approaches the vampire and removes the stick from his chest. The captive's eyes flicker to life and he starts looking around in disbelief. Like a cornered animal, he backs out on all fours. Keeps going in circles until he realizes he's trapped. Kadir steps on the man's chest and pins him to the floor. Why, who do we have here? Shit. No, come on, don't. Silence. The sheriff takes on an aura of utter dread. He appears as if he's a primal force of nature that's out to get you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do but shrivel in terror. The beast inside you shrieks, and you could swear it happens in unison with the instincts of some of the other guests here tonight. unlike anything you've ever experienced in this company during your turbulent first night as a vampire. He really did go easy on you, all things considered. It seems like it takes all of the hoodlum's willpower to not crawl into a fetal position and start crying. No, please, don't hurt me, man. Don't. You and me are going to have a little talk downstairs, at the prince's discretion. Please, go ahead, my sheriff. You heard the prince. Get out. Let's go. He doesn't wait for a confirmation. He just grabs the man and drags him, kicking and screaming out of the room. Conversations start all around. Some whisper, some quite overt. Sophie looks somewhat bored of the whole affair. Her eyes wandering from art piece to art piece, clearly finding nothing to her particular liking. So, what happens now? It'll be at least some minutes before Kadir gets the information he seeks out of the sun. Why not mingle while we wait for him to break? Excuse me. Sophie leaves your side and goes to a corner of the gallery where a group of kindred, some seemingly pretty old-fashioned, gathered. A concierge offers you a drink, still warm. It smells nice. Just a sip to start you off, a splash over your palate, coating your tongue and the inside of your cheeks. Nourishment. You're left to your own devices. You have a quick look around. The prince is currently talking to a dark-skinned woman that you recall seeing here those few nights ago. She has a cold but noble countenance to her. Their conversation seems to be casual. A loud, shrill laugh turns your attention to the respectable man who you saw with Sophie on the night of your judgment. He's making the rounds, chatting up different patrons. You feel somebody's eyes on you. A casually dressed, plain-looking man stands alone near a column watching you. He turns his gaze away sheepishly when he realizes you've noticed. Ooh. I mean, 
me. She did mention sh shanking. Oh gosh, Freudian slips. Thanking the prince. Uh, let's try to thank the prince for sparing us. You approach the prince, trying to stay as respectful of her private conversation as possible. She glances as you step forward. Her screening gaze mimic by her companion. She addresses the dark-skinned woman before turning to you. Excuse me for just a moment, Samira. Yes, Charlotte. What is it? I wanted to give you my thanks. Yes. I wish to thank you for sparing me, Prince. I realize it wasn't the neat decision to make, and I wanted to express my sincere appreciation. How thoughtful of you. She takes a long look at you before she continues. I didn't do it from the kindness of my unbeating heart. You are an asset to Ms. Langley, to the Camarilla, and to me. I believe I made the right decision. Prove to me and the other kindred of this city that it was so. And there might be more to your future nights than just survival and servitude. The dark-skinned woman looks impatiently at you and catches the prince's attention. Forgive me, that's all the time I can spare right now. We have some things to discuss with Samira still. Enjoy your night, Charlie. Just bow and leave. You leave the two women to their conversation, which they get back to almost immediately after the prince turns to Samira. You notice Sophie mingling with other kindred, clearly in her element and not to be disturbed. Kadir hasn't come back yet, so you can probably still find time for at least one conversation. Yeah, let's talk to the dude staring at us. There's something about this guy. It's not that he's staring at you, most everybody in this room has at one point or another. It's how he does it. He seems shy, maybe even afraid. It's hard to find a secluded spot in the gallery tonight, but this guy has an entire corner of the room all to himself. As you approach, he's standing alone with no glass in hand, a worried look on his face. Good evening, Mr. Larson, or you can call me Robert. Either is fine. Why are you staying alone here like this? What's your role in this court? So do you have a role in this court, or are you just here for the company? Now that's a loaded question. I'm one of Prince Panard's primogen. I'm here on business, in case the prince requires my insight. Usually it's so she can hear me out before ignoring me. Not sure if you were paying attention the other night, but when the prince mentioned diverging opinions on whether you should be executed or not, that was me. I was the diverging opinion. What's your reasoning? Not that I'm ungrateful, but out of curiosity. What was your reasoning? My reasoning? Just common sense. That you shouldn't be blamed for being assaulted and essentially murdered to boot. But as Kadir loves to say, the traditions are clear. Listen, I don't want to be rude, and I appreciate you reaching out. But word of advice, stay away from me. Many vampires in this sect regard my position as primogen to be some kind of a joke, you know? You talk to me, they'll notice, and they'll hold it against you. You have a quick look behind you and see that a few of the other kindred keep shooting you curious glances. One woman in particular, a redhead boasting a fanciful hairstyle, watches you disapprovingly. Some of them already do, I imagine. Excuse me, I need to try to get a word in with a few primogen members before Kadir returns. Enjoy your night. With just the critical looks of a few kindred to keep you company, you start thinking about who to pursue next. A loud exchange near the staircase grabs everybody's attention. Kadir is back, and the hoodlum is with him. The sheriff pushes his unfortunate victim 
inside the room. The vampire that threatened you last night is a mess. That stupid hat is still inexplicably on his head, covering some of his ruined face and more shadow. He's barely conscious. His shin is broken, you think. Something protruding there, making the pant like bulge. One arm seems twisted, a strange angle. Very little blood, surprisingly, but clearly a lot of hurt. Well, Kadir, did our guest cooperate? I told the prince your name. It's... it's Howard. And who you run with, Howard? The, the Midnighters. An Anarch Coterie, my prince. Active for some time now, but from... Though from what this one told me, the name is about the only legacy the group has kept over the years. I see. The prince, I didn't mean, I didn't know, I didn't... A loud crack makes some of the guests audibly gasp. As Pelier slap his looking at his jaw. A spray of blood creates something like an abstract art piece on the floor. An involuntary reaction. Your eyes lock onto the red drops and you feel only hunger. Even though you had some blood tonight, it seems like it's still not enough to fully control your instincts. This one is guilty of threatening a member of the Camarilla and claiming a domain without the prince's approval. That alone would be enough to pass with judgment. But he is also anarch scum. My prince? There can only be there can be only one bird. Final death. Do your duty, Sheriff. Unless, of course, someone that would like to play it in a good scenario. Like our dear Ms. Langley a few nights ago. The look the prince serves you and Sophie is a cruel jest. Sophie takes it gracefully, smiling and slipping her arm under yours in a strange public show of affection. Nobody says anything. The vampire named Howard jumps to his feet and makes for the window. Ooh, dominate. Order Howard to stop. The moment you catch Howard's eye, ordering him comes to your mind almost instinctively. Stop. He stops and looks at you with one eye. The other is rolling closed by Katir's interrogation. A swift slash separates his head from his shoulders. The body slumps to the ground and starts decomposing in front of your eyes. The sheriff, sword in hand, gives you a nasty smile from behind where Howard used to stand. Well, Charlotte, your eagerness is laudable if unnecessary. That Howard fellow couldn't have hoped to escape his fate, not facing to the youth expertise. However, I have made note of this show of loyalty on both your and your patrons' accounts. I would like to thank Miss Langley for bringing this anarch thug to my and Kadir's attention. I assume all have found the verdict satisfactory. It's a rhetorical question and everybody here knows it. Then I consider tonight's meeting concluded. Good night to all of you. She steps out of the room, and you see many of the guests move to do the same. Sophie seems to be conversing with Attention. somebody. We are being followed. Shall I dispatch the welcoming drones? Hey, Ryan, thank you so much for the follow. Everybody's been loving your tunes. A serious looking man in the trench coat about what transpired. You probably have the time to strike up a conversation of your own, too. Kadir Alazmai. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, is still here for one, but clearly getting ready to leave. 
Larson is still moping around, and the other man you noticed before Kadir brought the Anarch is still chatting with the remaining attendants. Talk to the sociable man. Let's get into Sheriff's good graces. I don't know, I think we want to make connections. Mm. I think we're good... We're in good with the sheriff enough that I think we can take a gamble with this uh, sociable glasses man. The well-dressed man had just finished talking to a few of the guests, who turned toward the stairs to leave the gallery. He notices you approach. Ooh, Thomas Arturo. Ooh, very fancy, very dapper gentleman. Interesting. Tomas Arturo. Harden is probably the most polite of these. Pardon? It's my name. I assumed you'd like to know. I know you by name only, of course. Charlotte? So tell me, how does it go to f how does it feel to go from victim to executioner's accomplice? I just wanted to be useful. Well, I just wanted to make myself useful. Even if Kadir had everything under control. Right. Nothing like a show of good faith in a public space. I get that. He takes a moment to clean his glasses, completely ignoring you until he's done and puts them back on. I'm sorry, got a bit distracted. You know most of us don't need to wear these, right? I can see just fine without them, but it's a statement. The damn things keep catching specks of dust and other assorted shit, though. Never stay clean for long. Sometimes I think they're more trouble than they're worth. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah, Flattery will get us everywhere. They look good on you. Really. You bet they do. Right, that was a nice chat. I have to catch up with a few other fellows, like this gentleman here. Genie! He doesn't give you a chance to say goodbye. He's already off, putting a hand on the shoulder of a mustachioed man nearby. It's right about when Sophie also ends her conversation and walks over to you. Interesting evening, wasn't it? Come, Gregory's waiting downstairs. She seems preoccupied with something and not in a talkative mood. It's an awkward ride back to the city. This time you arrive at another building. Just two streets across from your apartment. She brings you upstairs through a very nice lobby and a luxurious looking hall into her domain. Please have a seat. I shall be right with you. You take in your surroundings. The apartment is like a gallery. An old school smoking room that you've seen in some period piece once. And the noble rich living room meticulously combined together. Nouveau rich. Nouveau rich, I guess. Pronunciation is hard. Apologies. Old habits die hard. Clearly, some stick with you even after your death. She drags on her cigarette and breathes out. Breathe. How's she doing that? Can you do that? Oh, yes. You might not know. It takes some practice, but you can keep smoking if you'd like. Other things, too. Experiment. You might surprise yourself. But I did not bring you here to show off. This is where I rest these nights. Ooh, weird syntax. This is where I rest these nights. That door in the back, the bedroom. Similar to yours. I have servants and bodyguards in addition, of course. I brought you here because I need you to trust me. When I told you before that I needed your best behavior to uphold my good standing with the court, I meant it. But that's not the whole story. I have your interests in mind too. That's why I've given you your own haven. Why I'm trying to teach you how to navigate this new reality. But you need to trust me. Or else this won't work. You can come here whenever you feel like asking me something. My syntax is awful tonight. When you're in trouble too. Though I hope that won't happen often. I will ask you to come here when you wake up tomorrow. I'll have something to discuss with you. 
And then we're, st we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be playing nice. Gonna keep our head down for now until we kind of figure out our situation more. Maybe get a few cards to play. Okay. I'll come over for a thing tomorrow night. I appreciate that. That's silence again. There is definitely something on Sophie's mind tonight, but she doesn't seem eager to share it with you just yet. I'm leaving for another visit. Come downstairs with me. We'll give you a lift. A quick trip, a promise that you'll show up tomorrow, and some polite goodbyes later. You open the door to your haven and gather your thoughts. It's exciting, in a way, being dragged deeper and deeper into the secret society and its rules. Whatever Sophie has planned for you, it's bound to teach you more about this thing you have become. You sink into your vampiric sleep with just a sliver of hope. It's a welcome change. I think this is night four. Ooh. Long text tonight, okay. Once more, darkness falls upon the city. You wake up, same as you have these past few nights, in a windowless room. As you pry open the reinforced steel door, you look out the window to see, invariably, a sky bereft of sunlight. And then it hits you. The hunger. For a moment you let yourself wonder if there will ever come a night when it's just not there. Given what you've learned thus far, you probably have as much chance of kickstarting your heart with jumper cables. I mean, that's worth a shot too, though. You lock the apartment behind you and head over to Sophie's apartment. You did promise to call on her. Might as well not keep the lady waiting. And hey, what else are you going to do? Get in touch with your boss? He's probably looking for you, if only to scold you for the unattended files piling on your desk. But what is he going to do? Call the cops? Ugh. Not worth the hassle. You're almost hoping the few co-workers that seem to give a shit about you were faking it. It would make things easier. A fresh start from the ground up. Just like old times. These thoughts put you in a weird mood. It's a strange sensation to walk the crowded streets, the same as you would have, same as you have so many times before, but feeling so disconnected. All these people, you're not one of them. Not anymore. Oh, get some sleep, Brand. Thank you so much for sticking around. And maybe we'll see. Let's see if they give me the option to go for the amaranth. I've kept myself. Um, What's the word? Pretty spoiler-free about these games, so I'm really not sure what to expect. You're a vampire. Kindred. And you need to carve your own path into strange new existence, one way or another. Appropriately enough, you arrive at Sophie's building just as that thought crosses your mind. A quick word with the security guard, and you're led into the elevator. Apparently, Mrs. Langley is expecting you. Of course she is. Alright, is she Ms. or Mrs.? What are you keeping from me, Sophie? You knock and wait. Patiently. As the footsteps on the other side grow closer. Finally, the door opens and Gregory, Sophie's driver, invites you in. You find the lady herself standing by the window. Silhouetted against the city's midnight glow, she stares out, motionless, like a marble statue. Oh, shit, this is intense. Good evening. Good evening, Sophie. She doesn't react immediately, but seems to snap out of some meditative state and looks at you with strangely bleary eyes. Yes, good evening, Charlotte. I was wondering. When you look out at this city, when you see the lights, hear the hum, smell the rain on the pavement, what do you think about? 
You gaze out. The lights and rain, the relentless honking below. Music blasting from a nearby window. Echoing off the buildings. Someone should record an hour of this and throw it up on YouTube as an ambient piece. Other than that, though, it's business as usual. The sights, the sounds, the smells. You know them all too well. Sophie watches you. You can tell she's disappointed, somehow, but she covers it up with a courteous smile. Well, not everyone can appreciate the intricacies that the world offers. In fact, among kindred, my clan is somewhat notorious for finding innate meaning even in the mundane. You see, the blood that flows within me is that of Clan Toriador. There are 13 such bloodlines among us kindred, though that number has been contested in the past and these nights. It seems that nothing is certain anymore. The clans have gone by many epithets over the years, but the names used these nights have their roots in medieval times. The original Inquisition, if you can believe it. They use these to categorize us, describe our inherent differences. In time, we adopted them ourselves. Each clan has a uniqueness about it, inescapable, originating from an ancient progenitor, carried from sire to child. Hell yeah, the deep lore. For the Toreador, the gift lies in a sensitivity of sorts. We are uniquely attuned to beauty and ugliness both. We can see either where most cannot, a blessing on most nights, Occasionally a curse. Oh wow, I didn't realize the sheriff was a Toreador. I was guessing Gangrel for a while there. The sheriff is of my clan as well, although you'd be hard pressed to see him as such. Pork dear. It breaks my heart to see him in this state. Still, there is a beauty to it as well, nothing like a good fall from grace. Try as she might to act playful, you can tell she genuinely cares. She lets her gaze wander for a brief moment, but is quick to regain her composure. Then there are the Ventru, known for their pride and the proclivity to rule over others. The Prince represents that clan, as is quite common in our society around the globe. Where the Blue Bloods think themselves rulers, the Bruja like to see themselves as preeminent revolutionaries. They call for universal rebellion while being slaves to their own temper. We don't discuss the rabble much anymore, not after they've largely broken off with the Camarilla. To think they were philosophers once, long ago. I hope to tell you more about some of the other bloodlines tonight. Yeah, I don't think anybody's ever straight up told me my clan, so that seems a natural question. Do you know what my clan is? No. I can only guess it based on certain aspects of your behavior and tastes. You will need to come to your own conclusion and seek validation from your clanmates, if you require such a thing. As you will no doubt learn, some kindred fit these stereotypes more than others. The blood is hard to deny, though there are certainly those who try. But that is perhaps a subject for another time. I invited you here for a reason. There is something I wanted to speak to you about. It is customary in our society, especially among younger ch kindred, to organize into coteries. Sometimes these are called by the prince themselves or mandated by a fledgling sire. In our case, you may treat it as more of a strong recommendation. I want you to seek out companions, not only because you need to learn more about our society, but also because it is useful. True friendships are rare among kindred, but having allies, even temporary ones, is something of a necessity these nights. We might be selfish creatures, but we are drawn to each other nonetheless. Any suggestions on where I should start looking? I was just about to get to that. 
she puts on a mysterious smile. I spent some of my precious time last night asking around, pondering potential kindred for you to meet. Came up with a short list of contracts. Contacts. I hope you'll appreciate the gesture. Forging a partnership with them might offer perspectives and viewpoints that I cannot provide. Lenses through which to view our own kind. They are all members of the Camarilla, of course. More or less. Okay, who are they? Alright then, let's hear it. Who's on the list? Eager to learn about them, I see. Good. I'm glad. So let us start with the Tremere. They are a powerful clan, disliked by many, but fear and respected by many more. They have been an important pillar of the Camarilla since the very beginning. They are blood sorcerers. Blood sorcerers? You flash back to one of those nights when your ex would stay up late playing video games. Not a pleasant connotation. Sophie Snickers. Oh child, don't be caught with that look on your face when you meet a warlock in person. They really are adept at using Vitae. Their own as well as others to unique and potent effects. <clears throat> Since they are quite rigid in their hierarchy, the kindred I had in mind for you might need some... persuading. His name is Agathon. From what I hear, he is quite the scholar. Very ambitious. The child of a noted Tremere here in New York, Isling Sturbridge. Spend enough time with Agathon, and I'm sure you'll run into her sooner or later. Blood magic. Intriguing. This whole blood magic thing sounds intriguing. Oh yes, fascinating. It is also a well-kept secret of the Tremere. Don't expect them to share it right away. Some things have to be earned. Anyway, if you wish to contact the young Tremere, I hear you can usually find them in a New Age bookstore out on Broadway. The Tremere have one of their workshops there. Gregory will give you the details. Now this next recommendation comes with a bit of a caveat. As you recall me saying, most bloodlines have unique features that might not be obvious at first glance. Well, there is one clan whose members wear their curse on their sleeve. The Nosferatu. Oh yeah, the Nos boys. And Dames. And other folks. The way she said it, you're pretty sure it should mean something to you. Other than sounding foreign, it doesn't ring any bells. No wonder they make their havens and sewers, abandoned buildings and such. Their appearance is hideous and obviously unnatural. Had they walked the streets like other kindred, the kind would have learned of our existence long ago. She just shut her. It's hard to tell with her usual complexion, but you could swear her skin suddenly took on an even more sickly color. The one I have in mind isn't as big an eyesore as the worst of them, but he's no Adonis either. Still, he has some talents and connections that you might find useful. His name is D'Angelo, and he has an office, for lack of a better term, in the otherwise abandoned Grain Terminal in Red Hook, right next to one of those switch doors. The name escapes me. The ones with the awful furniture. A hey, shots fired. What connections does he have? You mentioned this D'Angelo has some useful connections. I was just getting to that. D'Angelo does odd jobs for Kadir, digging up dirt, locating kindred who would prefer to remain hidden, the kind of work the Nosferatu are best at. He's on a case right now, something to do with kind murders, I think. After your initial brush with our dear Sheriff, I think it would be wise to show some goodwill towards his agenda. Assisting D'Angelo with his investigation might be just the thing. She takes a brief pause to look out the window again. Now come the two more exotic proposals. Exotic? As if the blood mage and the vampire detective were business as usual. You may have heard about the Gangrel before. They are a wild clan in touch with their beast in a way that others might not dare to attempt. 
Nominally, they haven't been a part of the Camarilla for over two decades, but the one kindred I would like you to meet has a strong, shall we say, familial ties to the sect. Her name is Tamika. Her sire, Jezebel, was instrumental during the Battle of New York back in 1999, the very same battle that cemented the city as a Camarilla domain. Sadly, her achievements have gone largely unrecognized. Tamika and a number of her siblings still reside in the domain they were awarded after the battle, Prospect Park. Jezebel herself left the city some years ago, fed up with being underappreciated. You seem to know a lot about her sire, but is there anything else you can tell me about Tamika? I asked around that of all Jezebel's childhood, Tamika is known to be the most rational and cool-headed, at least for a gang. That said, she's likely to have a unique way of appraising your worth. I cannot say how exactly, but you should be prepared for an interesting conversation at the very least. Then again, that could be said of almost every kindred in this city. There's that mysterious smile again. So, you see, seeking out Tamika could prove quite educational. If nothing else, and who knows? Perhaps you will find her temperament to be a welcome change of pace. But speaking of a change of pace, I have one last suggestion for you. Though it's one I don't make lightly. The kindred who calls herself Hope. She's a Malkavian. They are a uniquely cursed clan. For centuries, we considered them mad, insane, unhinged. But those of us who spend enough time with them come to understand the truth. It is no sickness, but a unique perception of the world that has them appear to us as unstable. And that perception can prove to be very valuable. Having a Malkavian as your companion might be taxing on the nerves and a true test of patience at times. But their insight and intuition are unrivaled among kindred. As for Hope specifically... She is said to be a recluse, but I have it on good authority that she can currently be found in an internet cafe, I believe it's called, in Lower Manhattan. Gregory has the address. Where did you learn about her, exactly? One of my colleagues told me about her. He considers her uniquely talented and tapped into the current fads among kind. Not something I am personally interested in, as I'm sure you know by now. I take his word for it, at any rate. Well, I believe that's all of them. I still have a few social calls to make tonight, so I'll leave you to it. Use tonight and tomorrow night to arrange some cordial visits of your own. I will send Gregory for you as soon as I have further need of your services. Oh, that reminds me. You will need a car. Join us downstairs, won't you? She smiles once more and turns to her driver. He helps her put on her coat, and the three of you leave Sophie's apartment. Sophie points to one of the cars near the building as Gregory hands you the keys. It's a rather inconspicuous compact car. A decent looking, if not luxurious ride. Stay safe, Charlotte. This is your first night alone. Don't let it be your last. As they drive away, you find yourself with more freedom than you've had for the past few nights. A blessing or a burden? Time will tell. With a list of addresses in hand, you consider your next move. Searching for Hope. Sophie suggested you meet Hope, a reclusive member of the Malkavian clan. She's supposedly holed up in an indoor cafe in Lower Manhattan. Hell yeah, Malkavians are the best. It's a quiet, moody internet cafe. Half of its space serves as a comfy coffee bar these days, but behind the glass wall, it still has a space dedicated to a row of PCs. From the street, you can notice tired adults in casual clothes typing away absentmindedly, and some bored kids wasting the late evening hours on colorful online games. If Sophie's until is to be believed, this is where Hope has set up her haven. 
One of the waiters is standing outside the building, gazing at the sky with a smartphone in one hand and a vape pen in the other. You approach the man and tell him. I was supposed to meet Hope here. I probably tell you I'm surprised. People are usually far more discreet about seeing her. The man slowly takes a drag from his e-cig, sizing you up and down in silence. After a long, awkward moment, he raises his voice again. Come, right this way. He heads back into the cafe, and you follow his lead. When you make your way through the space with computers, no one averts their gaze from the spreadsheets, emails, Facebook profiles, or games of Fortnite. Fortnite. Fork knife. It's a common sight, one you wouldn't have paid much attention to a few weeks ago, but now, it seems so unnervingly quaint. Would they still be spending their time like this if they were mortal? The waiter unlocks an unassuming door at the end of the room and lets you inside. You two swiftly make your way through a labyrinth of sterile gray corridors, taking confusing twists and turns. Feels like you're traveling into a different world crossing one invisible portal after another. Eventually, you reach your destination. Your guide motions you to enter a dark room with a lone source of pale light. A computer screen in the distance, beckoning you to come closer. As you do, you hear the door shutting behind your back and a short chuckle echoing behind it. Is this the place? Nothing else to do but sit on a chair in front of the computer. The monitor displays a modern chart app. Modern chat application. Sorry, y'all. I'm just trying to get rid of um, somebody dropping in some, like, fake-ass links. Okay, cool. A cursor is blinking in the user nickname entry field in the middle of the screen, obviously expecting you to input your handle. After a brief consideration, you type in... Let's be bold. Let's do our name. Charlotte, better play it straight and prove you have nothing to hide as a gesture of goodwill. After a few seconds, the chat window opens, and messages start appearing on the screen in quick succession. Hostage executioner. Just to be clear, I don't have a wank rag. I'm just watching these scroll before I try to read them. Let's see, and should we clear it? I don't have a wank rag, cult of Luna, Lamau, Thirst Victim. Oh, for sure, hostage executioner, no. I'll scroll these and like linger for you all to read. Because this is kind of bananas. The 
chat goes silent, everyone seemingly waiting for you to say something before proceeding. This must be a close-knit group. Better say something before they kick you out. I'm looking for hope. Is she here? Yeah, this is a lot. Um, I'll linger on these for a bit, but it's basically just uh, chat ganging up on me. Presence. Try to get the Chandler control. Yeah, I'm gonna abuse the shit of his powers. You've had enough of these trash-talking randos. Time to teach them some respect. Your blood fires up. Ancient powers start to the Ancient power starts coursing through your veins, finger tapping the keyboard buttons on their own. You people better stay quiet if you know what's good for you. You have no idea who you're messing with. You will obey me. The chat goes silence once again, and then it explodes. Guess your powers don't work online, go figure. You know your cheeks would turn blood red right now if they still could. split second after you read the message, you feel someone's arms tightening around your neck. The violent return to reality catches you off guard. A jolt of panic rushes through your brain, paralyzing you momentarily. You've come to the wrong chat room, motherfucker. A ridiculous whisper rings out next to your ear, and the grip under your head gets even tighter. You start struggling, but even with your newfound supernatural strength, you're having trouble breaking out. This isn't the normal human you're dealing with. Last words. Ooh, good luck, I can't die. Good luck, I can't die. Just because you're kindred, got some bad news for you. The hand holding your chin shifts its position slightly. Don't struggle, or I will break your windpipe. Or my phone. Which would end even worse for you. Sounds of a camera shudder and light flashing. Did they just take some selfies with me? Alright, that's enough fun. I'm letting you go. We can have a talk. Don't do anything stupid, Miss Intruder. Pretty please? The mysterious assailant loosens their grip on you and gently pushes you away. You quietly turn to take a good look at them. Let me just finish this. It's a pale blonde woman in her 20s, giving you slightly judgmental looks while rapidly tapping away at her phone screen. First, you notice her outrageous outfit, seemingly thrown together from random thrift store finds. Then you take note of her tattoos, a sprawling tapestry of odd patterns and designs covering every visible part of her body. At first glance, it all seems aimless, but it has a consistent sense of style upon closer inspection. Her eyes focus on you for a second. 
Gave you a scare, huh? Sorry, that's what you get for entering a lady's haven without her permission. And she's back to her phone. With her relatively small build, it's hard to believe you had trouble overpowering her physically. But then again, nothing is what it seems when it comes to the undead. And even compared to the vampires you've met so far, she comes off as an eccentric, curious presence. She shoots you another glance, noticing you're still cautious of her. Calm yourself, girl. I won't pull anything like this anymore. It was just a... I feel stupid singing out loud. A vibe check. Vibe check. Yeah. Had a, got a glimpse of your vibe on the internet in a dangerous situation. I'd say you've got a pretty good idea of who you really are. I hope, by the way. If you're here, you've probably heard of me. So I went ahead and skipped the pleasantries, but come to think of it, I might have skipped too many of those. Yeah, she definitely fits the description you were given by Sophie. I still can't believe you got so mad online. You actually tried to use your powers on people talking trash about you. From who knows where, Jesus. But you know, I kind of respect that dedication. It's amusing. Anyway, don't worry about the chat. It was all a game to us. No hard feelings, okay? I'll introduce you properly later. On the monitor, the chatter continues normally. Your visit is like yesterday's news, no longer relevant to anything. But, uh, look, if we're gonna talk about... you... You should have something to say, too. What are you doing here? About the time she asked. Note to self, she really loves the sound of her own voice. I'm building a quartery. I'm looking for people to join my quartery. Quartery. Been there, done that, not interested. Unless... She takes a closer look at you. Her eyes go wide. Wait, 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 wait. Shit. Are you the new Langley plaything? Word seems to be getting around fast. Of course you are. It was obvious the second Langley got her hands on a new servant. She'd start building a network. Hmm. Mm hmm Your missions tell me that could really come in handy when... But Langley, that's a risky game. This kind of ambition attracts too much attention. Piss off. But then again... Fucking Kara. Hmm. Hmm. She seems to be having a spirited argument with herself. Only parts of it audible. Is it just you or do her facial expressions and body language change a bit between one sentence and the other? Before you make certain it's not just your eyes playing tricks on you, she focuses half of her attention back on you. The other half, of course, is still obsessed with her smartphone. Listen, I'm not saying I'm not interested in uh, cooperation, but before I make a decision, I need to make sure you sort of understand me and that I sort of understand you. And since I was planning to put on the show before you came here, I propose a little game. Hope perhaps in mind at least bends her phone in her hand, considering how to put her thoughts into words. Then she approaches a switch on the wall and flicks it. Neon lights flare up, illuminating the room. You take a look around. The room is certainly unique. It looks like a butcher's room, repurposed to be a living space. The modern computer in front of you starkly contrasts the ominous industrial walls. At the back, there's an overwrought bed covered in velvet with meat hooks hanging above it. On top of the bed sheets, you notice what seem to be pieces of elaborate S&M equipment and a camera. Wait a minute. You want my help? Moderate my cam show. Cam show. Your eyebrows twitch involuntarily. This is definitely not the kind of request you expected to hear tonight. She notices your confusion. Take it or leave it, buddy. You just became a kindred. But you want to become my partner in crime? Show me you can handle yourself while watching my back in my everyday environment. She's serious. The show starts in ten minutes. If you think yourself better than this, better walk out the door right now. 
I won't hold a grudge. I've got better things to do. As if to prove it, she looks at something displayed on her phone and cracks a brief grin. Another reply tripped down. Another reply tapped down with absurd speed. Tap, 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 tap. Nine minutes, it's now or never. Show moderator. Risk of violating the masquerade? High. Content warnings? Oh, yes. So, do you take the job? Where the hell up? Hope brightens up, and her smile looks surprisingly sincere. Excellent. I promise you might find this interesting in more ways than one. All right, give me a second. She spends a minute setting up the computer you used before, then urges you to sit down. The explanation of the modder's functionalities is simple. It boils down to ignoring anyone who doesn't disrupt the chat, banning anyone who does, and kicking anyone who's causing minor trouble. Five minutes later, she's already online, sitting on her bed in a provocative pose. Is it a sex show, isn't it? Her voice, previously hushed, brings out with full force. How are you doing tonight, hopefuls? You peek at the chat. Cult of Luna. We're not worthy. Queen Vulgar. Fucking A. Hopeful Luno. Angel. You're tempted to try out the kick and ban prompt as soon as possible, but obviously you won't punish someone for a little dirty talk. Thank you. Today's show is quite special. Please welcome our new moderator, Charlotte. Lamau. Lamau. Ooh. Lamau, sorry for something you've done this earlier. At least the community here seems to be a bit more welcoming this time. Looks like this place has an established hazing ritual. Or maybe they and Hope came up with one specifically for you. Who knows? You decide to stay silent. Eventually, people stop riffing on you and focus entirely on the star of the show. Alright, let's start this one with a bang, shall we? So this is where the strip show starts. You raise your head, curious about what kind of performance she's going for. First, she opens her mouth and reveals her retractable fangs in front of the camera. Right off the bat, the online audience is treated to a sight of her wholly human set of teeth turning into a monster's maw. The image is both revolting and fascinating. She raises her left wrist for everyone to see, and then bites. The fangs immediately turn her arm into a horrifying, gory mess. It's unclear if she used them to slash or bite, but one thing is for sure, no ordinary human could cause such damage. If an ordinary human suffered such a wound, you'd expect a geyser of blood to appear too. But it doesn't. Hope's technically a corpse, so it's impossible. She flashes a monstrous smile and starts smearing Vitae all over her hand to maximize the impact of the violent image. Then she starts drinking it up. She makes it a point to make the site as gruesome as possible, looking like a hyena feasting on a corpse. The contrast of her behavior with her look of an Instagram model is stunning. Once she's done, she reveals her wrist to the camera for the last time. She starts making theatrical gestures with her right hand as the wound begins to mend. Shortly after, the wound is gone. It's like a magician's trick. Her left hand looks nothing. Looks like nothing bad ever happened to it. Here's an appetizer. First blood to kick off the show. While you're wondering what the hell is going on, Hope catches a glimpse of your bewildered face and turns into your direction. How is that for an opening? 
this is gonna suck. Show your shooting snuff. Are you hurt? I mean, she's obviously fine. I mean, I'm not judging the snuff. This is in the section. What? what were you counting on me getting naked in front of you or something? Oh, honey, we've just met each other. If you expect a strip show, yeah, sorry to disappoint. This is more like a live stream digital art. The erotic subtext is there, of course. You peek at the chat, they're going wild. But eroticism is not the key here, it's vampirism. It's a new frontier, a living art installation. In the early 90s, the Japanese artist kept producing these videotapes of beautiful women committing gory harakiri. Those are an inspiration. She bears her fangs again in a devious grin. But I've not interest in auto self in auto destruction or turning myself into a victim. This is a celebration of a body I love, not self-inflicted punishment. The audience came here to marvel at a beautiful vampire and her awe-inspiring powers. Mending wounds is just one of these powers that people watching can pay to see more. Oh, and don't worry, the only things the audience can see and hear are the things I allow them to. We can talk freely, just remember to moderate the chat, will you? High risk of violating the masquerade. What a joke, she's blatantly breaching it in front of anonymous viewers. Still speechless, you turn your attention to the screen. You let the guy vent his excitement and seems harmless. A special message appears in the chat log claiming somebody has successfully sponsored the first goal of the show. Hope smiles and picks up a bag of blood from underneath the bed. It must have been retrieved from a blood bank. She showcases the label to the camera for everyone to see. Hope pours all the contents of the bag into her throat. You have no doubt it's real blood, but wonder why the viewers would be so satisfied with something that's so easy to fake. Don't worry, it pays well enough. You don't even bother to tell her this is not what you're thinking about. Safe to assume she knows. So what do you know about the kindred and the internet? Have they told you anything? While she's waiting for someone to sponsor her next vampiric feat, she decides to start a conversation. No, nothing. Well, it makes sense. Not the first thing you teach to a fledgling. See, some of us used to experiment with our own secure networks. We tried to build our own information hubs, social networks, everything. She's still working the phone in one hand while looking for something under the bed with the other. On how many things she can con concentrate at one time exactly. Then one day, the NSA got in. Turns out elders never really got the hang of proper security practice or the sigils they used to smear on their screen didn't exactly work as advertised. Then, of course, all the other three-lettered intelligence agencies in the world got the intel, and a lot of them decided bloodsuckers were the perfect new enemies for our post-9-11 times. The Second Inquisition came into being. Ever heard of it? A lot of our kind died just because they were too present online. Right now, the remains of our old network serve as government honeypots, kept alive to attract fledglings and hunt them down. You post a certain keyword on Twitter or Facebook, you get tagged for investigation. You fit certain patterns, you get tagged for investigation. So there is a certain thrill in becoming an online presence without attracting attention from the authorities. She stretches on the bed. Uh, 
I hope you're still monitoring the chat. Of course not. You're not as good at dividing your attention as she is. You correct your mistake and check the recent messages. She's keeping close tabs on you. Anyway, yeah. When the Nosferatu admitted to Camarilla their network had compromised, the others went batshit insane. Intercommunications became strictly forbidden. Whoops. There were executions. A lot of people who use social media to secretly contact their mortal families and lovers got off. That goes without saying. But if you weren't careful, even the most innocent web usage could result in being punished with final death. Thanks to user Dick Steele, the next goal had this gotten successfully funded. She raises her hand, three fingers up, two fingers down, one finger up. The countdown ends, and she immediately disappears from the screen, like a ghost. You can still see her on the bed, but the live feed indicates there's nobody there. When you deeply focus on the digital image, you swear you can make out some unusual glitching where her silhouette should be, but it could very well just be placebo. You ready for this? Three, two, one. A flash of the camera, the instant she reappears on the screen, she takes a selfie, sticking her tongue out in a provocative manner. The chat room explodes and cheers again. She is their vampire queen. You briefly wonder about her being glued to the screen. Is this the fantasy everyone is here for? A girl showing off cheap magic tricks while lazily browsing her social media? You realize you're way out of your depth here. Meanwhile, Hope decides to continue her lecture. Those were some wild times, especially in New York. While most of them have no clue as to our real nature, a lot of clandestine organizations have classified us as a national threat. And since this is where the towers fell, the agents are very the agencies are very much present around here looking for easy PR victories. The last SI raid here was just a few years ago, and it was a big one. It stirred up the hornet's nest something fierce. But although it's 2019, NYC is ruled by someone who got embraced before World War Fucking II. And the cam as a whole got really spooked and swore off the internet. Of course, they're not dumb and understand that you can't really coexist with modern kind without the internet. It's a gray zone right now, like piracy. Technically frowned upon, but let the one without sin cast the first stone. The SI is a real threat, no joke. But in any sense, it's the darkest place is right under the candle. You take another look at the screen. A familiar nickname pops up. You give the guy a kick for spamming the chat. The message is deleted so fast, Hope might not have even noticed. A duty carry out well. You're surprised to feel an inkling of pride. Oh yeah, fun fact about being a vampire, we can sweat and pee if we just exert ourselves really hard. Some of us can even orgasm, we can even cry, but only tears of blood. It's something I always dreamed of doing when I was 14. It's romantic, and it drives them crazy. As proof of her words, a scarlet tear starts running down her face. 
the chat goes wild. This seems to be exactly the kind of thing they've been waiting for. Just to be clear, you realize what we're doing here is a blatant breach of the masquerade, right? I honestly expected you to leave or inform somebody by now, but you haven't, have you? You try to focus on the chat. A familiar nickname is displayed on the screen. Looks like Mr. Masochist needs a longer break. After you ban him, you hear Hope's voice. Good job handling that guy. Great. If nothing else works out, seems like you fit this job at the very least. In any case, the last goal has just been funded. It's time for the great finale. This is what you've all been waiting for, right? Her voice has changed. She gets closer to the camera, letting her face fill the frame of the live feed. Her mesmeric eyes are focused purely on the viewers. Oh shit. You want blood? Come out into the streets, claw at your neighbor's throats, slash their veins, and drink up. Let's say yes, queens. Hope's presence becomes absolutely horrifying and it influences the chat in some incomprehensible way. Everyone starts typing like they are possessed. Liberate yourself from the shackles of ordinary morality. Make them scream. Feel the warmth in their entrails. What the hell is she doing to those people? What have you gotten yourself into? Transcend your bodies, release the message of hope into the world. She jerks violently for a second, then falls down on the bed like a marionette that had just had its strings severed. She exhales loudly a few times and laughs. When she does, the room goes dark again. All right, that's enough. Instead of continuing, she does something with her phone. The stream ends, and the chat instantly becomes dead quiet. Let me take over. The atmosphere in the room has completely changed. She's already put herself together and stood up. Now she's walking towards him. Adboy, what the fuck just happened? I cheer, guess the show is over. Everyone relax and go home. That hostage execution. Aw, and I was almost ready to come, bros. Cult of Luna. Hostage, I swear on my father's grave one day. I will find you and kick the ever-living shit out of you. After every line she delivers, she changes her voice, the way she puts her lips together, and even the way she moves. You've caught glimpses of her acting this way, but only now have you started to figure it out. Wait a minute, does that mean... Miss Point you like, I'm immortal, I'm bored, I'm separated from most vampires in the city by a generational chasm, and I'm so goddamn lonely, the internet used to be my only friend. And for the literature, years ago I started researching tulpas, Collective unconsciousness, all the mumbo jumbo at the intersection of psychology and spirituality. And I decided to experiment. The show was fake. And honey leave it. A few years later I was an Instagram fashionista, a successful erotic model, a vital part of pop cultural commentariat, a viral shit poster, a cryptocurrency expert. 
all of my internet cells started signal boosting each other, paving the way for new ones. I became a one-woman empire surrounded by legions of psycho fans. The chat was fake. At me. Some may think of it as dissociative identity disorder, but that's bullshit. Everyone has online alter egos they buried. I just resurrected them, gave birth to new ones, and let them crossbreed. Her constant tapping at the phone, even during the show, somehow. She is capable of impersonating an entire chat room. Literally a perfect angel. I don't even have a self that could dissociate me mentally ill. I'm a host, a living database. I live because I find it fun to be an information conduit, to process trends and support the ones I deem worthy. There was no masquerade violation, she was showing off her skills all along. She put you into a world of pure fiction the same way she was testing you back when she attacked you from the back. Damn, she's good at this. At Mount David Chapman. Of course you can just ignore what I'm saying and decide I'm just another deranged Mount Caveman, but hey. Annihilation of the self is the only way to survive in the 21st century. Android of Notre Dame. If there ever was an era that demanded images of beautiful people transcending beyond humanity and inspiring others to do the same, it's this one. Although for now, because of Masquerade, my audience is quite limited. Speaking of, you want to be the star of my next movie? Sure, why not? Sure, why not? Manhole Mermaid. I have a hunch you're just saying that. Still, hey, in a way, this too is transcending beyond self. But yeah, your test is over. Now the question is, do I want to work with you? She puts away her phone for the first time since you've met her, and gives you a good hard look. Out of vibe check, Vivo. I guess I can give it a shot. Yeah, you're not that dumb, you're not that boring, and you're kind of cute. Don't worry, no more modding jobs. Mods get attached. That's always bad news. She grabs your arm and starts leading you out of her room. I've put you through enough shit. Next time, I'll let you in on a little job I'm doing. We'll hit the streets, and you'll see why Sophie told you to contact me. She leads you through a labyrinth of gray corridors. It's a different route than the one you made your way through in. This city is so much more than what its elites consider real. Stick with me and I'll guide you to places Camarilla elders couldn't reach in a hundred years. She leads you out of your out of the building into the back alleys. At shitty trailer boys, even if someone rules the streets, we will rule the information highways. This is the power of hope. She lets out a theatrical laugh and disappears. You don't even notice when she leaves you alone, but you assume everything went as well as it could. A new ally. The power of hope. As you walk off into the night, everything around you feels a little less tangible than it did a few hours ago. Oh shit, I need to rest. Alright. Alright folks, it's getting late, and this is a pretty big file already. Thank you all so much for sticking around and sticking with me through this first official stream. Um, I don't have a set schedule yet, I'm still working on that. So, streams will kind of be uh, pretty sporadic. Uh, if I know ahead of time, I'll try to announce them ahead of time, otherwise just, you know, stay tuned. And if you're able to, pop in and say hi, I'd love to have you. All right. Thanks so much, folks.